My heart hammered in my chest as I tried desperately to mix the cocktail. The smell of muddy earth permeated the RV, and my hands were shaking so intensely that it threatened to spill the contents of the mixture everywhere. Surely everyone gets this nervous in situations like this, right? Who wouldn't feel a hint of trepidation when their friends coerce them into participating in their bizarre camping ritual? It was July 2017, and I was on a camping trip with my newly formed group of college friends. We found ourselves deep in the Smoky Mountains National Park, Tennessee, away from the hustle and bustle of civilization. Our designated campsite leader, Ellington McNulty, with eccentricity written all over him, had a thing for mixing strange drinks as a means to bond our newfound friendships. Colin, do you think these drinks will help us have more fun? I asked hesitantly. Colin Traversy, who had suggested I come along on this trip to break out of my shell, let out a hearty chuckle and said, With our buddies here? Of course. Outside, a dense blanket of fog hugged the surrounding trees, and clusters of sturdy wildflowers seemed to bow in submission. It felt both eerie and magical at once. Yo! cried Paul Upminski, whose bodybuilder frame cast an imposing shadow against the fading daylight. Did anyone else hear that? We paused and fell silent for a moment. The only sound came from Zane Mowbray fiddling with his phone in one corner of the RV. Oddly enough, we all pretended not to hear what Paul referred to. It was an unspoken rule on these trips. No scary stories or mysterious noises are welcome. We continued chatting inside our temporary home while darkness wrapped its iron grip around our surroundings. Laughter erupted among us as Colin told yet another ridiculous joke about horse detectives, which was more bewildering than funny. Suddenly, there was a violent thud on the outer wall of the RV, and we all jolted upright. Another loud bang echoed through the otherwise silent forest, and now we couldn't pretend not to hear it. Maybe it's some rogue boar or an angry deer, suggested Zane distractedly. Stay inside, I said. I'll go check. Trembling, I grabbed a flashlight and stepped outside the RV, carefully scanning the area. My breath caught, and my gut nodded as my beam illuminated a sticky trail of deep red seeping across the ground. Panic soared, and adrenaline made my legs feel like jelly as I turned to scramble back into the safety of the vehicle. That's when I saw him, a normal-looking man standing just at the edge of the clearing, partially obscured by billowing fog. The ghostly illumination made his features almost imperceptible, but something about his stance caused every hair on my body to stand out. He stood unnaturally still and unnervingly calm. My screams pierced through the night as I stumbled back towards our campsite. The group spilled out of the RV in confusion, guided only by my hysterics. What's going on? demanded Ellington, but before I could respond, an ear-splitting eruption rang out from behind us. The force was swift and sudden as we scrambled for cover. Who is that man? cried Paul in terror. We didn't have time to discuss who or what this individual could be. It felt as though we were in danger. Stuck in a remote location with no cell reception and unsure if anyone nearby could provide assistance, we felt hopeless. Threats loomed all around us in those dark moments. Fear ran rampant along my spine. The stranger didn't approach us. He remained at the edge of our campsite, crouched over something I couldn't quite see. The flashlight, lying on the forest floor where I had dropped it in my panic, cast an eerie glow over the man's focused endeavor. "'What's he doing?' whispered a terrified Zane. Bracing myself for the worst, I inched forward, careful not to make a sound. As I approached the beam of light, the sight was graver than anything I could have imagined. 
The man was hunched over, his hands slick with glistening crimson as he meticulously dissected. The lifeless body of a traveler, his face contorted in a final expression of sheer terror. Realizing the horrifying reality before me, I bolted back to my group without looking back at the monstrous man. We need to leave now, I shouted. They didn't question my urgency as they scrambled into the RV. Why aren't you calling for help? Ellington yelled as we sped off, hoping to find our way back to civilization. My hands were shaking on the wheel, and I admitted, there's no reception out here. We have to get to a better location first. After driving for what seemed like hours in fear and silence, Paul broke it by suggesting we use the GPS to find the nearest town. Finally reaching a small village, we found police officers who listened carefully to our panicked explanation of events. They decided quickly on a plan of action informing us they would seek out this man responsible for such violence while advising us to stay within the secured boundaries of the village. Unbeknownst to us at the time, they formed suspicions that their wanted criminal matched our description. Despite being unnerved by our encounter with the strange man from earlier that night and feeling unsettled from feeling traumatized, we thanked the police officers and found lodgings in a local inn. We planned on remaining until we began feeling certain about our safety again and knew that law enforcement had addressed the adversary. Falling into an uneasy sleep that night, we remained unaware of the continued horrors surrounding us. After three days in hiding within the village, word spread among villagers and travelers alike that there was news regarding the man we encountered earlier. The police had found additional casualties in various locations. Each victim suffered gruesome injuries with an unsettling similarity. A small band of travelers relayed chilling accounts of encounters in other nearby remote locations with someone matching our haunting memory. Like faceless shadows themselves, this ordinary-looking man struck terror into those who came across him leaving only destruction and suffering in his wake. Determined to put an end to this horrifying assault, the police organized search teams for every possible hiding place where the man lurked. They made progress in tracking him down, but he remained elusive and ready to attack again. Just as we dared hope the authorities might apprehend the attacker, we soon realized that this man's relentless terror was much closer than we ever anticipated. The innkeeper brought a newspaper with a headline screaming about a search for an escaped murderer. Gone mad during his imprisonment, his appearance resembled that of the one we had encountered in the woods. My blood ran cold as my eyes scanned over a photograph accompanying the article. It was him. All hope vanished as I realized we were up against not just a nightmarish stranger but also an experienced psychopath who had repeatedly eluded capture by authorities. The search intensified in our area as we continued to hide within the safety of the village. Police officers and villagers worked tirelessly to ensure their community's security while facing an impending threat. Days turned into a seemingly endless waiting game rife with anxiety and dread. As the final hours approached, local law enforcement radioed news of having finally cornered the escapee. But no celebration could be felt, as no one would soon forget those lost at his hands. Exhausted but relieved, we prepared to leave the village and began contemplating returning to the familiar lives left behind. However, before driving away from our temporary safe haven, our eyes fell upon our arrival's newspaper headline, Another Uncatchable Murderer Gone Missing, Only Miles Away. It's later revealed that this new killer is indeed not related to ours. He is still free. And just like that, we found ourselves once again trapped in misery and doubt about whether safety ever really existed or if it was all just an illusion hiding darker forces the world produced.
Drenched in sweat, I jolted upright while my heart pounded in my chest. It was a May evening in 2019, and I was camping with some friends near Lake Tahoe. Although our trip had started off as a fun and enjoyable experience, the past couple of nights had been marred by disturbing, unexplainable events. My name is Warren Eklund, and my friends who joined me were Pilar Munoz and Remy Gerard. We had rented an RV and parked it in a scenic spot beside the lake to make the most of our little escape from reality. As we sipped on our beers, laughing and sharing stories, little did we realize that something horrifying lurked nearby. The first incident occurred two nights into our trip when Pilar rushed into the RV after her evening stroll, horrified to find a mangled animal corpse, likely a rabbit or squirrel, judging by its shredded remains, arranged in a grisly display outside the bathroom window. We tried to pass it off as the work of some wild animal but couldn't shrug off our unease. After that night, we took care to lock up everything and stayed inside the vehicle after dark. We'd played board games for hours before finally drifting off to sleep. Until tonight. Despite being shaken awake by a harrowing nightmare, I couldn't seem to recall much of it. Only shrieks and agonizing whimpers. Glancing out the window revealed nothing out of the ordinary. Just trees and underbrush slightly swaying from a cool breeze. Warren, what's wrong? Remy whispered from across the dim RV interior. I simply shook my head. Bad dream. I muttered before trying to go back to sleep. Nightmares can't hurt you, right? But as much as I tried convincing myself of that fact, I couldn't shake an overwhelming sense of dread. The next day, we gathered around the campfire outside our RV to roast marshmallows. Remy lifted a bottle of soda as he recounted a humorous story from his childhood, eliciting bouts of laughter. I was the only one who couldn't fully immerse myself in the anecdote, the hairs on the back of my neck standing up as my eyes scanned our surroundings. When Pilar excused herself to fetch her camera from the RV, I kept watching. She waved cheerily at us through the window before turning her attention to rummaging through her bag. Then she froze. Pilar's eyes widened as she stared at something behind us. We whipped around to see what had caused such fright, and there he was. A tall man with unkempt hair and tattered clothing stood about twenty feet away near a tree line. His nails were long and filthy and his skin was covered in scratches and bruises. This stranger was holding a bloody knife in one hand, wearing an ear-to-ear -ear grin devoid of humanity. As we stumbled backward in horror, he began walking towards us slowly and deliberately. Why don't you tell me a joke? He growled, his voice gravelly and strained. What do you want from us? Remy screamed, his voice trembling. A smile. Came the man's chilling response as droplets of crimson fell onto the grass with each step he took toward us. Realizing we were cornered and without any means of calling for help, our phones had no service here. I desperately racked my brain for something to keep him from attacking. He wore a twisted smirk on his broken lips as I stammered out a terrible joke. Why was Six afraid of Seven? Because, um, seven, eight, nine. Silence met my words initially before that terrifying grin widened even further into a bellowing laugh that forced Bile to rise in my throat. The tension abetted slightly, but the man's frenzied gaze pierced through every one of us. You've bought yourselves another night. He barked before disappearing back into the woods. Our illusion of safety shattered and trembling adrenaline coursed through our veins as we rushed to pack our belongings and abandon this accursed campsite. But just as we were preparing to pull away, the man reappeared, knife in hand and not a trace of humor in his maddened eyes. As we stared in terror at the man reappearing with his bloodied knife, 
Remy finally found some sense and shouted, Get in the RV, now! We all scrambled into the vehicle with heart-pounding urgency. Without wasting a second, Remy started the engine, and we sped away from the campsite. The eerily grinning man seemed to be left behind as we gained speed, until he was just a small figure in the rearview mirror. But our nightmare was far from over. We knew we would need help, so Pilar tried to turn on the radio in an attempt to reach someone, anyone. But there was nothing but static on all channels. Frustration and panic overwhelmed the RV as we realized that contacting authorities would be impossible. Meanwhile, I couldn't shake off the feeling that we were being followed by the man. As much as I wanted my friends not to worry, I voiced my concern hesitantly. I think he's following us, I said fearfully. Remy glanced back at me, making me realize that my suspicions weren't exaggerated in any way. Our eyes locked for a brief moment before he focused back on driving. Let's try to find another place where maybe our phones will have reception, suggested Pilar while clutching her phone tightly as if it would bring a signal miraculously. For what seemed like hours, we drove relentlessly through winding roads and thick forests. The sun had long set by then, leaving us with an eerie darkness surrounding us. Eventually, we came across a small town and decided to stop there for assistance. Entering a local diner as soon as we spotted it, our group hoped for some help or guidance from the people inside. The diner looked cozy and inviting compared to the darkness outside. Paige approached a couple sitting at one of the booths while Remy called out for anyone there who might be law enforcement or private security. Paige's conversation was cut short as a sharp sense of dread washed over my body. I peered out the window and noticed the man from the campsite standing under a dimly lit street light, still holding the bloody knife. I shouted for the group to look at what I saw, just in time for him to vanish into the shadows once more and be replaced by another figure near the diner entrance. The newfound stranger opened the door revealing himself to be an officer with a sheriff's badge who had just entered the diner. Feeling a wave of relief, we recounted our encounter with the man to the sheriff and asked for his assistance. He nodded and informed us that several other campers had fled to this town after a similar encounter with a deranged killer. While it seemed like a dead end for both us and our frightful pursuer, the sheriff promised us protection and recommended that we stay close to town. The night eventually ended without further incident after we relocated ourselves. We still struggled to find sleep, as gruesome images filled our minds when we closed our eyes. The following morning, news sipped through that there had been another murder in town. It was evident that we hadn't truly escaped from the man's clutches yet. Panic-stricken, we decided to leave town before he could possibly get close to us again. As we prepared ourselves for departure, I recalled our interaction when I shared my terrible joke. What if it held some keys? Despite knowing I shouldn't dwell on this detail given how dangerous he was, it was a thought I couldn't shake off. Unbeknownst to us, our attacker was closer than any of us ever imagined. Dressed in official clothing with an uncanny resemblance to someone else in particular. A person who would do anything for pleasure and satisfaction in grisly methods. And though he eluded capture once again, no one saw him exit the town as he continued to haunt those who crossed his path. It wasn't until years later that the terrifying truth dawned on us. The maniacal stranger we'd encountered in the woods had been the sheriff himself who used his position to stalk and hunt victims mercilessly. We had unknowingly placed our trust in the hands of the very monster we were trying to flee. It was the first time I saw someone deep-fry a roadkill squirrel. 
Forgotten grocery list? My friend Jackson joked, tossing it into the makeshift fire next to our RV. Located in rural Kentucky, our tranquil campsite was nestled among tall trees and chirpy songbirds. As college friends who hadn't seen each other in years, we were all craving an escape from our mundane city lives. The five of us, Samantha, Jackson, Veronica, Mark, and me, had gathered for a long-delayed reunion. For me, being the most skeptical one in the group, getting away for a spell didn't seem like such a big deal, until that fateful trip. We pitched our tents around the RV and began exploring the area. It fascinated us from the onset, crystal clear lakes and towering oak trees surrounding our campground destination of Lake Cumberland. Our days spent hiking picturesque trails felt almost unreal, as if we were in some sort of beautifully drawn painting. Unfortunately, our immersion in nature came with an unexpected price. That evening around the campfire, I was retelling an embarrassing college story when suddenly we heard a blood-curdling scream nearby. Instinctively, all of us jolted to our feet, ready to help whoever needed it. We sprinted towards the source of the scream and stumbled upon another campsite nearby. A woman clung to her injured husband as blood oozed from his deep thigh wounds. Despite our medical ignorance, we managed to clean him up while Veronica assured her sobbing child that everything would be all right. Did you see who did this? I asked urgently. She shook her head with terror filling her eyes. It was too dark and she'd only seen a movement in the shadows but couldn't make out any specific details. We couldn't get any signal on our phones and didn't risk venturing out to alert the authorities. This was the countryside, after all, and locals wouldn't feel too good about outsiders just running through their neighborhoods at night. The injured couple's car had also been tampered with, making it impossible to drive away. The tension was palpable. None of us knew where the person responsible for this horrifying attack might be lurking or whether we were next. Finally, I mustered up some courage and said, Let our group stay close together, back by the fire. Keep watch and shifts. These words brought an uneasy agreement from my friends. As we huddled around our campfire for warmth and solace, we recounted the gruesome sight we had just witnessed and discussed what they were doing out here in remote Kentucky. Jackson glanced at everything from under his fedora hat but offered no further explanations. Suddenly, unnoticed footsteps disrupted our turbulent thoughts, heavy, getting closer all too fast. Before we knew what had happened, we saw him, a man, if you could even call him that with matted hair covering his face and wild eyes darting erratically around. He reeked of something insidious mixed with sweat, causing us to retreat in disgust. He held a bloody instrument resembling a cross between a dagger and an ice pick, a menacing sight that made us freeze with terror. In an instant, he closed the distance between our petrified group and himself faster than any horror movie monster. Mark barely had time to raise a chair in self-defense. The man swung his weapon relentlessly, as if fueled by some pent-up rage that would only be quenched through violence. We tried to rush through him towards safety, fearing the worst simultaneously, which seemed inevitable at that moment. Panic filled my chest as our encounter with this stranger unfolded before my eyes. With little choice, we scattered in different directions, attempting to evade the maniacal attacker. Veronica, injured husband in tow, stumbled towards the nearby woods, desperate for cover. Jackson and Mark sprinted towards the main road, hoping to flag down passing vehicles for help. I ran in the opposite direction entirely, hoping to find something or someone who could help. But every door I banged on remained shut. Whether it was fear or apathy preventing the residents from helping, I couldn't tell. Turning a corner, 
wearing stained clothes and gasping for breath, I found a phone booth. Hands shaking, I dialed 911 and frantically explained the situation to the operator, who assured me that help was on its way. Bow rose in my throat as I thought of my friends and prayed they were still alive. Clutching a makeshift weapon, a sturdy stick that had been lying nearby, I cautiously made my way back to our campsite by retracing my steps. The once safe haven was now eerily quiet. The fire had died down to glowing embers, and no voices could be heard. Suddenly, I heard a piercing cry from the direction of the woods. Adrenaline coursing through my veins, I sprinted towards the sound with zero regard for my own safety, only wanting to help whoever was at risk. In a small clearing within the wooded area, I discovered Veronica and her husband cowering at the base of a tree, their hands up in defense as the attacker loomed over them. Without thinking, I heaved my stick at his head with all my might. The blow connected with his temple sending him stumbling backward before he recovered enough balance to redirect his attention towards me instead. However enraged he already seemed before, he turned into an unleashed fury focused on getting vengeance against me, leaving Veronica and her injured partner forgotten as they quickly took advantage of his distraction. As he charged at me in blind range, I took note of the uneven terrain surrounding us. Gripping my stick tightly, I sidestepped at the last second, causing him to trip over gnarled tree roots. The force sent him crashing headfirst into a jagged rock with a sickening crunch. His body crumpled and lay still. We all stood frozen, holding our breaths, until we heard the distant wail of sirens approaching. The man, identified as a local named Earl, who had been going on a killing spree these past few weeks, was taken away in handcuffs and a pool of his own blood. The attacker was revealed to be a local man named Earl, disgraced and dishonorably discharged from the military due to his uncontrollable violence against fellow soldiers. Since that dark night, he has lurked in the shadows of rural Kentucky, seeking solace for his bloodlust by sabotaging vehicles and attacking innocent passers-by. As time went by and we healed both physically and emotionally, we vowed never to forget the tragic story that had ensnared us, nor the victims of Earl's rampage taken before us. Though justice had been served, things would never truly return to how they once were leaving an indelible mark etched upon our collective memory for as long as we lived. I was camping in Halfway, Oregon, setting up my RV in a cozy spot, when I noticed a half-eaten sandwich on a nearby picnic table not the way I expected to start off an unforgettable month. My name is Felix Hawthorne, and I have a dark sense of humor, which sometimes puts people on edge. As I adjusted my camping gear, my neighbor in the campsite next to mine sidled up to me to strike up a conversation. Her name was Jocelyn Kendrick, and she was on a road trip using her late aunt's RV. We got along well as we joked about the sandwich incident. Jocelyn suggested that perhaps it belonged to someone who couldn't decide between becoming a vegetarian or not. Over the next couple of days, campsites filled up with vacationers pouring into the area for adventure and relaxation. One evening, Jocelyn and I were roasting marshmallows for S. Mores when an unnerved family entered their campsite across from ours. The four of them, two adults and their kids, appeared to be talking anxiously amongst themselves. Intrigued, we casually strolled over and asked if everything was all right. The father reluctantly explained that they'd stumbled upon a man in the woods a few miles north of the campground. He'd been lying face down on the ground, not moving at all, until they approached him. Suddenly, 
He shot up onto his feet and sprinted away without saying a word. The family had rushed back to camp, feeling bewildered and creeped out by this strange encounter. Jocelyn and I laughed nervously at their story but didn't really believe it could have been some sort of dangerous situation. As urban dwellers ourselves, we figured these things were just typical happenings in rural areas like this. However, over the next few weeks, growing unease crept into our otherwise idyllic retreat as other campers reported unsettling encounters with the same strange man. According to the stories, the man had a twisted appearance, gaunt, tall, and unnaturally pale, like someone who hadn't seen the sun in years. The camp's atmosphere turned tense as people speculated about the uneasy intrusions. Call it bravado, but I couldn't help feeling skeptical. My rational mind dismissed these eerie tales as pranksters or active imaginations. Jocelyn shared my skepticism, though we did feel sympathy for those who seemed genuinely scared. Late one night, Jocelyn and I decided to take a quiet moonlit walk around the camping area to calm our nerves. As we wandered along a secluded trail flanked by towering pine trees, we walked right into him. The eerie stranger was standing there in our path, like some lost apparition. His ghostly pale skin seemed to stand out against the shadows of the woods, and his eyes glinted in the moonlight as they pointedly stared at us. Jocelyn gasped in shock but quickly tried to regain composure by nervously quipping about her abandoned gym membership. My pulse hammering in my ears, I tried to keep my own cool and called out a hesitant greeting. Yet all we received in response was an icy, piercing gaze that chilled me straight through. Irritated by the growing unease stirring within me, I started to question if anything was genuinely wrong with this man. When no medical emergency seemed apparent upon closer inspection, I asked if he could tell us his name or why he'd been acting so strangely around camp. Not surprisingly, he didn't respond. As soon as we turned our backs, ready to walk away from this creepy encounter, an unnerving cry pierced the air, a gut-wrenching mix of anguish and rage that resounded through halfway still night air. Though skepticism stubbornly clung within me earlier on, it left violently as I clutched Jocelyn's hand, and we both sprinted back to the safety of our RV. When we reached the door, out of breath and with adrenaline running through our veins, we looked back to see him standing at the edge of the woods. His eyes fixed solely on us as he unleashed another primal scream, promising unimaginable terror. In that moment, it was all too clear that this small community nestled in eastern Oregon had fallen victim to a sinister force beyond anything we could explain logically or casually dismiss with humor. In the following days, Jocelyn and I became increasingly fearful of our surroundings. It felt as though the entire community was being enveloped by a dark presence that none of us had ever seen or imagined before. Yet, we couldn't bring ourselves to leave because, deep down, we knew that leaving would not save us from this unknown force. The attacks began to escalate. First, a few people in camp went missing, their screams echoing through the night just before their disappearance. Some had tried calling the police, but no one arrived or even responded to the frantic calls for help. It seemed as if Halfway had become completely cut off from the outside world. After seeing the stranger at the edge of the woods on that haunted night, we rarely ventured out of our RV. It was there that we discussed our options and weighed the risks of fleeing against staying put. The question remained, how could we exit without facing this mysterious villain? Eventually, our predicament led us to conclude that staying put would be too dangerous. We decided to reach out to Bill and Shannon, another couple who had shared their fears about the stranger with us earlier in our stay. We formed a plan to leave camp together on foot during daylight hours, 
leaving at night would have been a risk none of us were willing to take. Our exodus commenced early one morning, when most of Halfway's residents were still asleep. As frightened and desperate as we were, we didn't waste any time packing our belongings. Fear lent some sense of urgency. As we walked along, I couldn't help but glance back at our abandoned RV. Suddenly, there he was again. The eerie stranger stood next to it with an unsettling grin crudely etched across his lips before silently disappearing into thin air. Bill and Shannon saw him, too, from behind me. Their expressions turned cold with shock as they realized this relentless entity wouldn't be deterred by a simple change in geography. It would stalk us relentlessly, regardless of our quiet efforts to escape its wrath. Bill suggested that if we quickly dispersed and hid separately, we might have a chance to evade the stranger by confusing his pursuit. Jocelyn hugged me goodbye, a lump forming in my throat as each of us fled in different directions. Hours passed as I hid, and the adrenaline began to wear off. A still silence echoed throughout the woods. That's when the ominous, gory truth behind the stranger's intent emerged, one by one, blood-curdling screams rang out in the distance, piercing the fragile hope that remained within me and painting a terrifying image of what was happening to my friends. Eventually, I heard my name being called. It was Jocelyn's voice uttering feeble whispers like it was almost out of breath. Cautiously, I followed her voice until I found her lying on the ground, covered in blood but still alive. The stranger had cut her down, leaving her fate up to me. Panicking, I placed pressure on her oozing wounds and assessed my options for getting her medical help. But then Jocelyn spoke up weakly and confessed that she wasn't attacked by the seemingly paranormal stranger. She revealed that Bill and Shannon were behind everything, the missing campers, the staged haunting appearances, and attacked her out of greed for our property. They had planned these horrifying events around halfway with perfect execution and had disguised themselves so convincingly with makeup and props. All to forcefully acquire what everyone else in halfway possessed. Her revelations sent shockwaves through me, understanding that no supernatural force was driving this nightmare scenario but human nature itself the depravity found within our own species responsible for sowing terror amongst us. As we stumbled back into camp, battered witnesses to Halfway's tragedy fueled by greed-driven betrayal, we could only hope those remaining would believe our truth and never fall victim to the darkness that now permeated this once peaceful community. It was the smell that woke me in the middle of the night, a putrid mix of burning rubber and spoiled meat. Jolted awake from sleep in my RV, I jumped out of bed to see what was causing the rancid odor. I'd parked for the night in a small clearing, located just off Route 211 in a remote area of Nevada. My friend Arnold Thompson and I were on our way back from a camping expedition at Great Basin National Park. With sheer exhaustion settling in, we decided to stop for some much-needed rest. Arnold stirred and mumbled something incoherent. His face contorted with confusion as he registered the same sickening stench filling his nostrils. What's that smell? Jeez, Tom, he croaked out. Taking it upon myself to investigate, I grabbed a flashlight and headed outside. Immediately struck by the bone-chilling cold, I wrapped my jacket tightly around me as I scanned the area for any sign of what could be causing such an abhorrent odor. Our surroundings seemed calm and unchanged. Nothing appeared out of place. Suddenly, laughter erupted from somewhere in the darkness. It sounded strange, like wet sponges slapping together with manic force, and it echoed through the still night air. Did you hear that? Arnold whispered, clutching a baseball bat as if it were his lifeline. 
I nodded cautiously, my grip tightening on the flashlight. The unsettling laughter gradually ceased. Its absence only made our surroundings feel even more unnerving. We hesitated before venturing deeper into the clearing together, following subtle tracks leading away from our RV. What we discovered next not only stopped us dead in our tracks but also stole every bit of courage within our bones. There before us, illuminated by moonlight filtering through tree branches overhead, stood a tall man dressed in tattered clothes with unkempt hair hanging down his back. His skin, a sickly gray color, clung haphazardly to his gaunt frame. Dark eyes glared at us with malevolent intent, as though they'd been waiting for us all along. The man made a grotesque sound, like the purr of a rabid, feral animal, and scraped a sharp, rusty knife against the stone in front of him. The abrasive noise sent shivers down my spine. As quickly as it began, the sound died down. Arnold and I exchanged looks of panic but knew better than to draw unnecessary attention to ourselves by calling for help or reaching for our cell phones. The isolated area seemed unfrequented by travelers or authorities alike. We had no assurance that anyone would respond to our desperate pleas. Sheltered only by the darkness from the man's malicious gaze, we felt every ounce of dread course through our veins. Inexplicably, the man started dancing around a morbid shrine he'd created from various oddities and roadkill picked up from who knows where. It was then that I noticed the flames licking around him. It looked like he was cooking something over an improvised bonfire pit. As I tried to process what was happening, Arnold gestured towards an exit from the clearing. His logic appeared simple retreat back to safety while the man remained preoccupied with his sinister activities. But before we could move, our luck ran out. Those merciless black eyes locked onto ours once more. He'd become aware of our presence, sensing that neither of us was alone in this nightmare any longer. With the man's gaze locked on us, Arnold and I knew that our opportunity for escape had slipped away. Our hearts pounded in our chests as we mustered courage and stood our ground. Speaking in hushed tones, Arnold and I agreed that the best course of action would be to cautiously back away from the clearing, avoiding any sudden movements that might provoke this sinister individual further. As we carefully retreated from the scene, a sudden gut-wrenching scream erupted behind us, causing Arnold and me to momentarily freeze in terror. We realized another person was in distress nearby, and they required immediate assistance. We debated whether to ignore the plea for help or to risk facing a confrontation with the malevolent man. It quickly became clear that ignoring someone's desperate cry for aid went against our principles, even if it jeopardized our own safety. With no guarantee of being able to call for outside help due to our remote location, we decided to confront this situation head-on. As we cautiously approached the source of the screen, we noticed a woman tied to a tree near the man's makeshift bonfire pit. Her hair was disheveled, her clothes tattered, and it was evident she had been subjected to unspeakable torment by this calculating perpetrator. Focusing on outsmarting our foe rather than engaging him directly in combat, Arnold came up with an impromptu plan. He threw a loose branch into a neighboring bush, creating enough noise for the man to turn towards it momentarily. Seizing the opportunity, I grabbed a nearby rock and threw it at the man's head with all my strength while Arnold sprinted toward him. The rock impact stunned our nemesis long enough for Arnold to tackle him to the ground. Relying on his weight advantage and adrenaline-fueled determination, Arnold managed to disarm the man with his rusty knife while pinning his arms down. I rushed over and began untying the terrified woman, reassuring her that we were there to help. Once she was freed, the three of us worked together to restrain the man effectively, securing his arms and legs with the ropes that had previously bound the woman. 
After confirming that our captor was no longer a threat, we sought shelter in our RV. Inside, we discussed what to do next. The woman, who introduced herself as Lily, told us that she had been hitchhiking when this man kidnapped her. He had driven her deep into this isolated area days ago with the twisted intention of utilizing her as a human sacrifice. Determined to see this criminal brought to justice, we decided to drive back to civilization with our captive stowed in the RV's bathroom, his limbs still securely bound. With poor cell reception and uncertainty surrounding how long it would take for authorities to arrive on the scene, we deemed it safer and more efficient to handle matters ourselves. Hours later, as we reached a small town with a police station, we retold our harrowing encounter. The events played back in our minds like an unsettling horror film. The officers listened intently before taking custody of the deranged man and promising us justice would be served swiftly. As Arnold, Lily, and I prepared to part ways after the ordeal, we couldn't help but feel grateful for having survived this encounter together. We exchanged contact information and vowed never to forget that fateful night in which chance led us through a nightmare from which we ultimately emerged triumphant. Only later did we learn the full gravity of our experience as shocking details surfaced about our once captive antagonist. He was notorious for abducting hitchhikers who passed through secluded byways. Authorities suspected he considered himself a caretaker of an ancient evil force lurking within the remote woods beyond our world. My friend Max and I had always been risk-takers. From back when we were kids, daring each other to jump from larger and larger tree branches to our current high-adrenaline hobbies like skydiving and bungee jumping, when he suggested a trip in his brand new RV through the isolated wilderness of Wyoming's Wind River Range, I couldn't refuse. The journey was uneventful at first. The only unexpected event was a large raven dive bombing our windshield one late afternoon, scaring the life out of us. It left a morbid mark on the glass. But our spirits weren't dampened for long as we stopped to take part in recreational activities, hiking during the day and exchanging jokes around campfires in the evening. July brought scorching heat, with temperatures up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. During this time, Max oh so wisely thought it would be hilarious to puncture our water bottles, pretending not to hear my annoyed protests against taking cold showers. The hottest day hit during our fifth week of travel when we set up camp near a small creek that barely managed to cool us off. Despite the beautiful views and tranquil atmosphere, there was something off about this place. A feeling of unease crept over my skin as we prepared for another night under starry skies. As we sat around the fire, I told Max some local history I had picked up nearby. Hey Max, did you know there was a string of unsolved murders in this area back in the 70s? Some guy went on a rampage, torturing and killing hikers in their sleep. Instead of seeming disturbed, he laughed with cocky disinterest. Nice try, but you won't spook me that easily. Unable to convince him of my sincerity, I sighed and took a walk around the area while he foolishly tested his ability to toss marshmallows directly into the fire from increasingly far distances. While wandering, I noticed something strange on a pile of rocks nestled underneath a tree. Upon closer inspection, it appeared to be human hair, long, curly strands stuck in the crevices. Feeling my appetite dissipate, I returned to our campsite and found Max indulging in his third burnt marshmallow. Uh, Max? I found something bizarre over there. I pointed towards the rocks with genuine concern, but he just smirked without taking his eyes off the fire. 
Wow, really doubling down on this creepy story angle tonight, aren't you? Somewhat defeated and truly concerned, I resigned myself to spending the night in this ominous locale and hoped my imagination would stop running wild once I was safely inside the RV. We soon headed inside to sleep for the night when we were interrupted by faint crunching sounds outside. The sensation of being watched sent a severe chill through my body as I peered out of the window. Paranoia suffocated me as darkness hid whatever threatened our safety. Suddenly, our previously lazy campfire roared higher than before. Intense shadows danced on the surface of our white RV. With swift, ghastly clarity, an unnerving figure emerged from behind a nearby tree. The man was tall and built like those notorious burly lumberjacks you've seen on TV. His disheveled clothing hung heavily from his muscular frame. He glanced around suspiciously before fixing his menacing gaze upon our RV. He moved towards us with unsettling intent. His walk was animalistic and predatory, as though he were stalking prey, feeling fear for the first time in years. My heart felt like it would explode with each beat. My hands were shaky as I hurriedly grabbed Max's arm to alert him to the imminent danger. What is it? His voice was tense with fear upon seeing the look of sheer terror plastered on my face. I could only mouth. Look, directing him towards the window. Max's eyes widened. In that instant, time stopped. The only audible sound was our hearts pounding as our previous bravado was completely stripped away. Max and I exchanged panicked glances as the menacing figure approached the RV. Neither of us dared to make a sound, fearing that it might draw his attention. Our thoughts were in sync. We knew we had to get help but couldn't risk giving away our hiding spot. As the figure drew closer, we noticed deep scars crisscrossing his face. His hands were mangled, with gnarled fingers ending in filthy, jagged nails, clear signs of a man who endured brutal physical labor. The man's soiled clothes, particularly the overly worn boots, hinted at a nomadic life. With trembling hands, Max fumbled for his phone to call for help. His nervous fingers accidentally activated the flashlight function just as the figure reached the RV door. The sudden blast of light stopped him in his tracks. He looked startled by this unexpected development. Seizing our chance, I threw open the RV door, and we made a run for it as fast as our legs would carry us. We had no idea if he would chase us but fear lent us strength and speed as we darted through the darkness. As we ran, my mind worked over time to come up with a suitable way to ensure our safety while not compromising myself or Max any further. Alerting campers nearby could put them in harm's way, and even calling the police might endanger responders if this man was as dangerous as he appeared. We dashed into a thicket of trees and hid behind them to regain our breaths and think of what to do next. Suddenly, Max spoke up with a plan. The ranger station is only half a mile away. We can go there and alert them without putting anyone else at risk. Nodding in agreement, we moved cautiously and swiftly towards the ranger station. Each snap of a twig or rustle of leaves heightened my adrenaline levels keeping me constantly on edge that our pursuer might find us. Upon reaching the ranger station, we banged on the door to seek help from the officers stationed there. A stern-looking ranger answered, her eyes hardening when she saw our terrified expressions. We hastily explained the situation, describing the sinister figure that had nearly attacked us at our campsite. A team of rangers departed immediately to assess the situation, leaving us at the station for safety reasons. Max and I nervously exchanged glances as what felt like an eternity passed. Finally, the rangers returned with surprising news. They found no trace of the menacing figure, 
only our abandoned RV near a pile of rocks marked by human hair strands. However, they had discovered an old cabin deep in the woods, apparently long abandoned but previously inhabited by a man fitting our description. According to local records, this man was an ex-lumberjack who turned his back on society after suffering a terrible accident that left him severely disfigured and in chronic pain. The townspeople claimed that he took refuge in the woods to avoid attention, becoming somewhat of a hermit. The rangers insisted that they would not allow us to return to the campsite until they could ensure our safety. They offered their assistance in moving our belongings from our RV while Max and I arranged for alternative accommodations. Relieved but still shaken, we could not help but wonder what might have happened if we remained at that eerie campsite for another moment. Our encounter with this disturbed man left an indelible scar on both of us. Whether he intended to cause harm or was simply a tormented soul lashing out, we may never know. In memory of that horrifying experience, Max and I made a conscious effort to be more cautious about our surroundings whenever we ventured into unfamiliar territories. Staying vigilant and relying on one another ultimately lent us new strength, a lesson we carried with us as we continued exploring life together. It was a blue cheese omelet that started it all. The flavor was a bit too pungent, which made me push the plate away in disgust. My camping companion, Julian Kendrick, shrugged his broad shoulders nonchalantly. Well, I thought it was tasty, and besides, we don't have much else to eat now, he said, smirking and popping a morsel into his mouth. August 2017 found us camping in an RV in one of Big Cypress National Preserve's campgrounds. We'd been spending our days fishing and hiking the serene landscapes of Florida's lush wilderness area. It was a great way to escape the pressures of daily life and bond with nature. One afternoon, we encountered an elderly local who regaled us with tales of the dark underbelly of these pristine surroundings. Tales of illegal moonshine operations nestled deep within the swamps. I brushed them off as fantasies born out of late-night drunken stupor or creative boredom from this sleepy part of the country. I couldn't have been more wrong. The day after our odious omelet experience, Julian and I set off for a trek through the swampy wetlands near our campsite. A few hours into our hike, we stumbled upon something unnerving, an abandoned shack with broken windows and a rusty no-trespassing sign dangling from a nearby tree like an ominous pendulum. I suggested we leave the shack and continue our hike. Julian chuckled nervously, opting instead to explore it further, eliciting a groan from me. We gingerly approached the dilapidated building and noticed that, despite its rundown exterior, there were recent-looking tire tracks in the mud near its entrance. Against my better judgment, we crossed the threshold into the shack's dimly lit interior. A putrid stench pervaded the cramped space. There were what seemed like human bones in one corner, and various rusted tools scattered across a makeshift workbench. Suddenly, Julian let out a surprisingly high-pitched scream. His eyes were wide, staring at the center of the room, where an unconscious but still breathing man lay bound and beaten, his skin covered in gruesome lacerations. He stared at us with pleading eyes. Panic coursing through my body, I fumbled for my phone to call for help when I heard footsteps outside. My heart raced faster as the door creaked open, revealing the silhouette of a tall man holding an axe. His physical features were nondescript but unsettling. The angles of his face seemed too sharp to be human, but his intentions were clear. The man's lips curled into a twisted smile as he surveyed his next victims. He swung his axe menacingly above his shoulder and began advancing toward us, 
filling me with an overwhelming sense of dread and despair. In that instant, the consequences of police action, or even cutting our trip short paled in comparison to the immediate threat before us. I locked eyes with Julian, who managed to stutter out. Knock, knock! I raised an eyebrow, bewildered by his spontaneous stab at humor. Who's there? He implored in an exaggerated tone. Julian! I spat under my breath as we backed away from the encroaching axe wielder. Interrupting Cal, he blurted out through shaky breaths as we reached the broken window. The momentary confusion those words left etched on our attacker's face was just enough time for us to dive desperately through the shattered glass. We scrambled out of the shack, Julian sprinting ahead while I lagged behind, nursing a gash on my arm from the broken glass. The dense forest seemed to close in around us as we ran through the trees, desperately trying to distance ourselves from our attacker. Despite the throbbing pain in my arm, I managed to keep pace with Julian. Fear and adrenaline propelled me forward. However, thoughts about the shack and its horrifying contents intruded on my concentration. Who was that man lying there? As we continued running, I heard branches breaking and hushed voices in the distance. A rush of hope filled me as I caught a glimpse of two forest rangers hurrying toward us through the trees. Panting, we stopped and hastily briefed them about the axe-wielding man and his gruesome lair. The rangers didn't waste any time. One insisted on taking Julian and me back to their outposts, while the other stayed behind to assess the situation at the shack. We followed our would-be rescuer along a narrow path that eventually led us out of the woods. When we reached their outpost, it was a small building with a radio tower sticking up out of it like a thin antenna. The ranger immediately called for help, detailing our horrific experience to his colleagues. While we waited for backup, we felt an eerie calm settle over us, something that felt deeply unsettling given all that had just occurred. The shack left us with unanswered questions and an even stronger sense of dread but at least we were with the authorities now. When reinforcements finally arrived, they were quick to secure our safety and began investigating further into the chilling events at the shack. The forest ranger who remained at the scene provided updates via radio conversation. The unconscious victim from inside was sent for immediate medical attention. Preliminary findings suggested he had been kidnapped by a mysterious serial killer who left disturbingly intricate traces at every crime scene, signs that only a well-trained eye could decipher. This revelation seemed like something right out of a crime novel and left us feeling uncomfortably unnerved. As the police continued their investigation, they discovered that the killer had been stalking hikers in the area for an extended period and we realized just how lucky we were to have escaped with our lives. A few days later, the police apprehended the psychopath responsible for the horrors at the shack. Shockingly, he was one of their own, a highly respected detective with a twisted double life. We struggled to process this news, grateful for having evaded his malicious intents but burdened by guilt for those who hadn't. It was a bittersweet ending that left us grappling with not only our physical wounds, but also the psychological traumas of that distressing day in the woods. Regardless of everything, we stood as survivors against unparalleled dangers and faced an incomprehensible monster. And even though our adventures would likely never be as carefree as before, Julian and I could still hold on to one sentiment— we managed to overcome an experience that would haunt us forever, forging an unbreakable bond between us. To say that the camping trip was eventful would be an understatement. I, Alden Brownstone, 
was feeling incredibly excited to finally get away from the monotony of city life and take a break out into nature. My RV, filled with snacks, supplies, and more obscure movies than anyone should ever own, was packed to the brim. My best friend Rex joined me on this adventure to the quiet forests of DeSoto National Forest in Mississippi. As we got deeper into the park, I couldn't help but joke about making sure we didn't end up like those campers in that one slasher film. You know the one, well, maybe you don't. It wasn't all that popular. Our first few days camping went by without any surprises. We cooked hot dogs over the fire watched movies while rain fell softly outside the RV, and took long walks through nature trails with exotic names like Black Creek. One evening, we were enjoying some much-deserved beers when Rex found a bizarre-looking tree stump by our campsite. It appeared as though someone had forcibly twisted and mutilated it. Hey, Alden! Rex called out as he leaned in to take a closer look. Doesn't this remind you of that scene where a guy gets tortured in that weird foreign film we watched last year? I laughed. Yeah, no kidding. It looks like someone's got too much time on their hands if they're out here giving trees the horror movie treatment. But no sooner had I jokingly dismissed it when Rex discovered something even eerier. Several long strands of curly brown hair that had been forced into the gnarled grooves of the tree stump. The uneasiness that settled after seeing those strands slowly evaporated as Rex joked that maybe Bigfoot was having a bad hair day. The joke provided a bit of humor in an otherwise uncanny moment and broke our temporary tension. Little did we know, the real thrill was just beginning. Later that night, the only thing cutting through the pitch-black darkness was the gentle flickering of our campfire. Wrapped in blankets, we sat engrossed in yet another obscure movie from my endless collection. As we watched, there was a faint crackling sound. It sounded like someone or something was rooting through our food supplies on the picnic table. Not cool, dude! Raccoons, bears, whatever you are, those chips are for humans only. Rex exclaimed half-seriously as he moved to check on our snacks. Holding up a flashlight, he cautiously scanned the darkened trees just beyond our campsite. From where I was sitting in the warmth of the fire's light, I could see the tendrils of terror tightening on Rex's heart as his face paled. Without any warning, a man stepped out from behind a tree and into the dimly lit clearing. He was tall and thin, with stubble covering his gaunt face and lifeless eyes that seemed to pierce right through us. The sudden appearance made it clear. This was no animal sneaking around our food. This was someone far more unpredictable. Hey, he casually said while giving a slight nod in greeting. Through clenched teeth, Rex replied with an unenthusiastic wave of his hand. Inching closer to me for support, Rex whispered nervously as we both tried to assess this uninvited stranger. Depression was evident under his eyes, as if he had been sleeping very little or not at all. We offered him some water and food, which he hesitantly accepted but didn't partake in right away. Instead, he stood there, muttering under his breath while rubbing bony fingers against his wrists as if wiping away an insistent itch that wouldn't go away. His overall demeanor sent shivers down my spine. We tried to have a casual conversation with the man, but he wasn't responsive. As we engaged in shallow, nervous banter, the stranger's gaze followed us restlessly. The encroaching atmosphere of tension was unbearable, and so, without warning, Rex cracked a joke that was sure to change the mood. What do you call fake spaghetti? An impasta, he shouted while laughing at his own lame humor. Rex's light-hearted joke seemed to shatter the tension as we briefly paused our uneasy conversation about the campsite intruder, but the relief was short-lived. After a moment, the gaunt man began moving toward us, 
making Rex and me increasingly anxious. We need to leave. I whispered to Rex seeing the terror in his eyes. He nodded in agreement. We started backing away from our campsite, but before we could make any significant progress, the tall man lunged at us. He grabbed Rex by the arm and pulled something sharp from his pocket, a knife. Desperate to save my friend, I shouted out for help, hoping someone nearby might hear my desperate call. A park ranger appeared seemingly out of nowhere, as if he were already looking for the man. The ranger began shouting commands at him, distracting him just enough for Rex to pull away from his grip. With the bloodied wrist where the stranger had held him tight with the knife, Rex stumbled toward me, and we ran together while watching the ranger attempt to subdue our assailant. The commotion had managed to attract several other campers close by who rushed over to offer assistance while we tried to catch our breath and calm ourselves down. In addition, more rangers arrived on the scene, swiftly handcuffing the tall man who had been terrorizing us minutes earlier. Claiming that they knew this was not some random attacker because of recent similar occurrences within the area, park officials moved quickly to ensure that everyone around them was safe and secure. As they loaded that gaunt stranger into their vehicle for transport back to their station, one of the ranger's studios spoke with us about pressing charges against him but warned that he most likely had severe untreated mental health issues that drove his dangerous behavior tonight. Throughout those following days of writing our statements and answering questions regarding our traumatic experience at Campsite No. 12, we revisited that frightful encounter with the man. But as unnerving as it was, we could not help but strangely find solace in knowing that the authorities had taken steps to keep others safe from his unpredictable and aggressive behavior. Had we not been the unfortunate victims of his actions that night, others might have suffered a much more serious or potentially deadly outcome. Days later, with the ordeal seemingly behind us, authorities brought closure to their investigation Raising a chilling question in my mind, if this mentally unstable individual had traveled from state to state attacking campers for several months undetected until now, what other dangers lurked in the shadows at unsuspecting campsites? As I thought about this newfound fear, I realized that we had emerged from the experience with a heightened sense of awareness. The innocence of camping, an ideal outdoor escape, had been tainted by the stark reality that danger might be lurking at any turn. And even though we never imagined experiencing such a moment of terror on this trip into the woods, Rex and I developed invaluable instincts on how to confront potential threats in uncertain environments going forward. With our bond stronger than ever before, we agreed to make use of these newfound instincts while continuing our adventurous journeys together. Armed with our renewed vigilance against hidden threats, we knew that no matter where our travels took us or what unexpected situations arose, we would face them head-on without allowing fear or doubt to hold us back. I was elbow-deep in barbecue sauce when it happened. My friends and I had decided to take advantage of the warm July weather and head out for a weekend camping trip in Worsley Woods, Alabama. We rented an RV and set up camp near the edge of the woods, aiming to truly immerse ourselves in nature. We had spent the entire day doing various outdoor activities like hiking, swimming in the nearby lake, and my personal favorite, grilling. As Kevin, a stout fellow with quick wit, cracked another of his offbeat jokes about microwavable pork rinds, our conversation abruptly halted at the sound of rustling leaves nearby. A tall man emerged from the woods. He walked with a slight limp and seemed to be dressed entirely in tattered clothing, which suggested he had been living outside for quite some time. As he approached our campsite, I noticed that his eyes seemed sunken and hollow 
with a piercing gaze that was simultaneously intriguing and unnerving. Can we help you with something? called Ramona, a strong-willed brunette who was never one to shy away from confrontation. The man only grunted before proceeding to make his way around our campsite, examining each item we had scattered about as if sizing up his prey. We exchanged nervous glances among us but didn't move from our spots around the grill. Then he reached into his pocket and pulled out what appeared to be some sort of ragged cloth. Slowly unwrapping it revealed several sharp objects, scalpels and kitchen knives, that glistened under the fading summer sunlight. Hey, you can't just walk in here and... I tried to muster some courage, but my voice cracked as he slowly raised one of the knives to his own face. With surgical precision, he began carving into his own flesh. We watched as blood trickled down onto the forest floor below. Caught somewhere between horror and fascination, all chatter ceased among our group. We were rooted to the spot, too stunned by this ghastly scene to move. While we stared, unable to tear our eyes away, the man's bizarre self-mutilation continued. He deftly sliced around his left eye, eventually pushing it out of its socket and dropping it onto the ground. I felt bow rise in my throat like a volcanic eruption, blacking out for a brief moment as my vision swam. It was Ramona who finally took charge. Plucking up all her courage, she approached the grisly spectacle. Stop that right now, she said sternly, as if addressing an unruly child. The man didn't even pause his assault on his own face. Instead, he locked eyes with her and smiled with bloody lips before sinking the knife deep into his cheekbone. Ramona turned to us in panic. We have to get out of here now, she whispered urgently. None of us could argue with that. We scrambled towards our rented RV for safety. Kevin barely managed to start the engine and yelled for everyone to buckle in as we hurried along the bumpy dirt road leading out of Worsley Woods. The adrenaline pumping through our veins made it difficult to process what had just happened during what should have been a fun weekend getaway. What do you think his deal was? Matilda, Ramona's usually reserved sister, asked as we nervously monitored the woods for any sign of pursuit. None of us knew how to answer her question. The terrifying image of that man carving into his own face still seared fresh in our memories. Suddenly, a sudden bump blocked our way and threw us off course. The RV came skidding to an abrupt halt, barely avoiding a collision with an immovable fallen tree lying across the road. As we fumbled to unbuckle our seatbelts and assess potential damages, a metallic sound echoed from the distance. We looked back towards Worsley Woods, and there he was, dragging a rusted chain behind him as he limped menacingly in our direction. Our minds raced with fear, yet none of us could even think about calling for help. Perhaps it was the disbelief of what we just witnessed or the uncertainty of what would happen next. But we couldn't take any chances. We had to figure out a way to get past that fallen tree and escape from the approaching menace. Kevin grabbed a flashlight inside the RV, and with Matilda and Ramona by his side, they hurried outside to survey the scene and hopefully make a plan. Let's try to move this as fast as we can, Kevin yelled, but as they pulled and pushed at the branches and trunk, the tree didn't budge. With panic setting in, Ramona quickly suggested trying to drive around it. Kevin agreed, and they all rushed back into the RV. As he put it in reverse, turning towards the side of the road with more space, they could hear the dragging chain growing closer. As they lurched around the tree, barely missing its branches with every movement of their vehicle, all eyes remained focused on that monstrous man still coming towards them. He was now close enough for them to notice some characteristics, tall and muscular, 
wearing dirt-stained clothes that looked like they were once part of a mechanic's uniform. Strangest of all was his expression, a twisted smile that seemed to be permanently etched onto his face. Just as they got around the tree, one of its smaller branches got caught on one of their tires. Kevin hit the gas pedal hard, tearing it away from its grasp and sending smoke everywhere. With the final spin in place, their RV launched forward away from their pursuer. But before anyone could breathe a sigh of relief, loud pounding on their roof sent shivers down everyone's spine. The man clutched onto the top of their moving vehicle with one hand while swinging his weapon in another. Call 911! Matilda shouted as she tried dialing her cell phone. Ramona followed suit, but all anyone heard was static. Desperate, they looked around the vehicle for anything they could use as a weapon. Spotting a tire iron under one of the seats, Matilda picked it up. But Kevin, still focused on driving, quickly reasoned with her not to fight back. If we tried to confront him now, we're just putting ourselves at more risk, he explained. Instead, Kevin swung the RV from side to side in an attempt to throw their attacker off balance. After this maneuver went on for a few heart-pounding moments, the pounding on the roof stopped. Kevin slammed on the brakes, allowing everyone to catch their breath. It suddenly dawned on them that they'd lost phone reception and, perhaps even more terrifyingly, were completely alone. They continued driving until they found a signal again and then called the police. Officer Erickson received their report and assured them that a patrol would be sent out immediately to check Worsley Woods and surrounding areas. The group let out nervous sighs of relief as they arrived back in town, believing their ordeal was finally over. Little did they know, something sinister lingered at Worsley Woods. Several days later, while searching through some old newspaper clippings in the town's library, Matilda stumbled upon an article dated twenty years ago about a gruesome murder case. The lead suspect was a man named Miles, a mechanic who worked at the edge of town, who was never convicted due to a lack of evidence. Looking at his mugshot, Matilda gasped. There he was, that same twisted smile etched permanently onto his face. It was a bizarre coincidence when I found out that an anonymous donor had gifted me with a fancy RV for no reason. After months of working from home and lockdowns, I decided to take a break and explore the beautiful landscapes the United States has to offer. I set off on my adventure in June 2021, starting from my humble abode in Scranton, Pennsylvania. My destination? The majestic Grand Canyon in Arizona. Friends always said that Jasper Schumacher, a software engineer, didn't have a sense of adventure in him but I was determined to prove them wrong. The journey was smooth for the most part. I marveled at the stunning landscapes unfolding before me as I drove through vast stretches of the country. One evening, after hearing from fellow campers about a picturesque location by an extremely rare white oak tree and small creek near Height Crossing Bridge in Utah, curiosity piqued me to head over there. As I parked my motorhome under the boughs of that majestic tree, I admired how its thick trunk and sprawling branches seemed to shield me from any external threats. This secluded spot seemed like the perfect place for stargazing before turning in for the night. You picked quite a camping spot here! Jake Evans Blackwell's voice startled me as he approached on foot from the surrounding wilderness. In his mid-thirties, Jake's rugged features complemented his tall frame and sandy brown hair. Yeah, I replied with a chuckle. Picked it just so you'd have to hike miles to find me, so we don't have any tents close by. We shared some good laughs and heartwarming stories until darkness descended upon us. 
Before we knew it, an eerie silence gripped the area like a vice. Worried about bears or mountain lions nearby but reluctant to express my fears audibly, kisses from Jake felt like an oasis of comfort. Suddenly, we heard the unmistakable sound of twigs and leaves crunching, growing louder as if someone were approaching. Closely, though we weren't doing anything wrong, a strong feeling that we weren't alone swept through me. Peering into the darkness, I could make out a figure slowly revealing itself in the pale moonlight. He looked just like a regular man, except for his unnerving grin and piercing eyes that seemed to stare into our souls. Something about his authoritative stride, unkempt hair, and disheveled clothing sent shivers down my spine. He looked human enough, but his actions were anything but. Within seconds he was upon us, grabbing Jake by the throat with an unyielding grip. Desperate to help my friend, I grabbed a nearby rock and swung it at our attacker. To my horror, the rock smashed into his face with an unsettling thud as blood spurted out from his nose and mouth. I stood frozen, watching as the blood streamed down his face, but he didn't even flinch. Instead, his grip on Jake's throat tightened, and I knew I had to take action immediately. Help! We need help! I yelled with all my strength, hoping anyone in the vicinity would hear. But my calls echoed off the canyon walls, and I realized there was no one around for miles. Desperate, I looked around for something else I could use to defend ourselves. A hefty tree branch caught my eye, and I picked it up without a second thought. Despite the fear that surged through me like electricity, I swung it at the man with all my might, hitting him squarely across the head. His grip on Jake faltered for a moment as he stumbled under the impact. Gasping for breath, Jake dropped to the ground and scrambled away from our attacker. No longer restrained by Jake's body, the man now focused his attention on me. He raised his bloodied face toward mine, revealing his now-twisted grin with a dark red liquid oozing from between his gritted teeth. I turned and ran in blind instinct, dragging Jake along with me as we went deeper into the labyrinth of trees that surrounded our campsite. Panic-stricken yet determined to survive this nightmare that came straight out of a horror movie, we kept moving even when our legs screamed at us to stop. As we continued running through each turn of branches and trunks that seemed to merge into endless darkness, I noticed something remarkable. The terrifying man wasn't able to catch up with us despite a faster pace. He began to tire, as if he had exceeded some limit that bound him back. Slowly but steadily, we increased our distance from him until we could no longer see his expression or hear his footsteps behind us. We finally stopped when we felt certain that he had given up his pursuit. In utter disbelief, we tried to make sense of what had just happened. Who or what was that guy? Jake panted as he caught his breath. It's like he ran out of energy or something. I don't know, I replied with a shudder. But we need to get out of here. Now. Cautiously, we made our way back to the motorhome. We discovered that he'd left it untouched, and our phones were still inside. As soon as I could dial the number, I reported everything to the local police and begged them to come and investigate. Later, during the police investigation at Height Crossing Bridge, they uncovered strange markings etched into the white oak tree where we parked our motorhome. The markings seemed to be ancient symbols of some sort that resembled a protective barrier. In the days that followed, we learned from a local historian about an old tale of a murderous man who roamed these lands centuries ago. According to legend, he was cursed by a powerful shaman for his heinous deeds and confined within boundaries marked by those very symbols carved in the white oak tree. The realization that we'd unwittingly parked our motorhome on cursed territory sent chills down our spines. 
We couldn't quite wrap our heads around that interaction with a spirit bound by ancient magic wearing a human face. Gathering the remnants of our journey, we said goodbye to Height Crossing Bridge and vowed never to return. Though shaken from the terrifying experience, we survived, and new gratitude owed itself not just to our resilience but also to an old curse holding ancient power over an evil soul. Mid-campfire sing-along, our cheerful voices echoed through the serene surroundings of Moosehead Lake in Maine. My friends and I had gathered for our annual fall camping trip, ready to enjoy a weekend of relaxation away from our busy lives. My name is Kenton Whitlock, and this particular excursion marked my first time joining them since moving back to the area. Pine-scented smoke billowed through the air while the sound of the crackling fire provided a soothing soundtrack for us to unwind. The weather was unusually mild for October, allowing us to savor the crisp autumn night without being overwhelmed by the cold. Okay, folks, time for another round of two truths and a lie, declared Marcia Ginsburg as she speared a plump marshmallow onto her toasting stick. This time, let's raise the stakes. Whoever can't guess correctly does the dishes tonight. We took turns sharing two truthful stories and one fabrication about ourselves. Most involved trivial or humorous events from our lives. Marcia had adopted an abandoned kitten. Seamus and Gwyn was allergic to watermelon. And Bethany Sinclair had been in a hot air balloon race. As darkness deepened and shadows consumed the trees beyond our circle of light, I lost track of time. My turn arrived just as I finished a swig of lukewarm beer. All right, I began hesitantly. Well, uh, I can juggle cats with one hand carefully, though. My friends burst into laughter at my absurd statement. My second confession was darker painting a gruesome scene from my past. I once stumbled upon the aftermath of an elk mutilation during an investigation for my park ranger job. I shared somberly. The conversation died down as each person imagined the grisly sight I described in vivid detail. And finally, an offbeat claim. I've walked across every state in the U.S. dressed as the Easter Bunny. We laughed tentatively. And then, when Marcia spoke up, her eyes narrowed. Okay, I think the entire story is a lie. Kenton isn't a park ranger. I agree, chimed in Seamus. I was with him last fall when he worked at that ad agency in the city. The rest of the group nodded in agreement, eagerly waiting for my response. Gotcha, I yelled triumphantly. It was actually the Easter Bunny gig. I only dressed up for a couple of charity events in two states. As we relished our victory over Marsha, our proclaimed camping queen, the mood lightened again. We recommenced singing around the fire, ignoring any unease left behind by my elk story. About an hour later, Seamus disappeared into the woods to gather more firewood. We didn't worry. He'd done this countless times before. But as minutes turned into an uncomfortable eternity without a word from him, concern crept into our hearts. Feeling responsible for his absence, Marcia urged us to search for Seamus with her. Equipped with flashlights and warm clothing to combat the dropping temperatures, we ventured into the darkness beyond our campsite. The moon loomed large above us, casting eerie shadows through the dense foliage. A dozen steps away from our sanctuary of light and laughter, we were engulfed by an unsettling silence, a far cry from the lively atmosphere only moments before. We searched for what seemed like hours with no luck until we saw glints of red between the phalanx of trees. Approaching nervously, we found horrifying remnants, 
an unidentifiable mass of flesh and blood smeared on brambles and greenery, taking us back to my grisly elk story. But this time, it wasn't just a story. Panic coursed through my veins as we realized that Seamus was missing and there was no immediate explanation for the gruesome sight before us. Another instant of horrified revelation sent a shudder down my spine. Someone or something was with us in the woods. Hysterical, soaked with terror, we clung to each other as a dark figure emerged swiftly, quiet as a shadow and just as sinister. A man stood before us, his face concealed by shadows and an odd sense of malevolence emanating from his countenance. The man lifted his arms slowly to reveal a jagged weapon, glinting menacingly in the moonlight. We stammered and scrambled to devise a plan while trying to maintain composure amidst the rising terror. We had no choice but to flee from the armed man stalking us. Escape seemed our only hope for survival, since fighting back or questioning him was not a viable option. We ran in separate directions, our hearts pounding with fear. Marcia took off toward the campsite, hoping to grab her phone and call for help. I sprinted toward the part of the forest that seemed less dense, thinking there might be more people around who could aid us. Despite navigating through thickets and fallen branches amid complete darkness, we remained hopeful that we would survive this nightmarish ordeal. Minutes passed like hours as I kept running while periodically checking behind me for any sign of the armed man. It seemed like he had not followed me, but I couldn't afford to ease up just yet. Meanwhile, Marcia reached the campsite and searched frantically for her phone. To her dismay, she discovered it was dead, drained of battery power since she neglected to charge it before leaving on the camping trip. Desperate and frightened, she decided to head back into the woods to regroup with the rest of our friends. As we tried to regroup amidst growing panic, we noticed that one of our friends was missing, Jamie. He must have run off in a different direction during our chaotic flight and now he was nowhere to be found. We decided that rescuing Jamie was our top priority. Help or no help, we could not leave him at the mercy of an armed man-man capable of inflicting unimaginable harm on his victims. With determination and courage, we continued searching for Jamie throughout the forest labyrinth, calling out his name between panting breaths. Through our collective efforts, we eventually found an injured Jamie lying under a tree, alive but battered. As relief washed over us upon reuniting with our friend and as we began attending to his injuries, a chilling presence took form close by. The armed man had caught up with us, his weapon held high and ready to strike. Preparing for our impending doom, we were left in disbelief when an unmarked police car crashed into the scene taking down the armed man in the process. Officers jumped out of the vehicle and immediately arrested him. It seemed impossible that someone had come to our aid during our darkest hour. The arresting officer explained how they had received a report of suspicious activity from the park ranger's office before entering the forest. Luckily, their quick response saved our lives that night. Relieved and thankful beyond words, we finally learned who had invaded our haven in the woods. Our attacker was a local serial killer who had already claimed several victims in a nearby town, something we could have never fathomed as we unknowingly set up camp that day. Looking back on the horrors of that experience, we can finally start piecing together those haunting memories. Each survivor is forever haunted by what might have happened if those officers hadn't arrived just in time to save us. As life goes on, we are reminded of Jamie's injuries and the friends that narrowly cheated death, haunting moments where everything might have slipped away. And it is because of those horrors that we strive to never forget the lesson learned that fateful night. Always be prepared for anything because life can change in an instant. 
like when darkness falls over a simple camping trip with unassuming friends. I woke up with a tinge of nausea, knowing something was off, but not quite sure what exactly. It was October 2018, and I was camping in my RV at the gorgeous Crater Lake National Park in Oregon. My name is Prescott Thornton, and I'd been enjoying the crisp autumn air and mesmerizing shades of fall foliage without a care in the world. Or so I thought. I happened to meet a group of fellow campers who had driven down from Seattle. For close friends, Elspeth Marsh, Nikolai Rayner, Trudy Carrington, and Fletcher Witt. Instead of allowing my nausea to fester throughout the day, I swallowed my pride and slipped into casual conversation with them. Did any of you feel a bit queasy this morning? I casually asked between laughs at Elspeth's comical anecdote. Oh, Trudy chimed in, her tone serious. Last night, someone mentioned the water from the campground might be contaminated. That might be why you're feeling off. Do any of you need any Pepto-Bismol? I carry some around just in case, I offered. They looked at each other and shook their heads declining my offer but grateful for it just the same. Trudy continued to tell us that she had overheard someone say that a local man had taken issue with tourists coming to the area and might be attempting to scare them away by contaminating water sources in retaliation. Although skeptical about this apparent local man's existence, we decided to stay vigilant for the rest of our trip. As we explored the park together, we felt like locals rather than tourists. We traversed rough terrain while keeping an eye out for anything suspicious. That night, after a small bonfire gathering with my new friends from Seattle, we went our separate ways to get some sleep inside our respective RVs. But just as I was about to drift off, I noticed something strange outside my window. A man, nondescript and unassuming, dressed in plain gray clothes, stood at the edge of my campsite. He appeared to be observing another RV nearby. The man's presence made my stomach churn with unease. Alarmed, I tiptoed to Fletcher's RV and relayed the situation as quietly as possible. Nikolai and Elspeth soon joined us. They shared that they'd seen the same man earlier, near the park's water supply. At least he stopped contaminating the water, Fletcher joked, which made us softly chuckle despite the alarming situation. We hatched a plan to confront the man as a group. Rigging up flashlights and whatever self-defense gear we had between us, pepper spray and walking sticks, we set out as one to approach this stranger with caution. As we approached him, I could see his coarse beard from our flashlights veins popping on the side of his face, and something unsettlingly evil in his eyes. Terrifyingly, he was holding a pair of pliers in one hand while unseen items dangled from his other hand behind his back. Hey! Nikolai shouted with authority. Put those down! The man looked undeterred but paused long enough for Fletcher to make a move for the pliers. What are you doing? Trudy yelled, her voice aggressive yet shaky at the same time. But instead of answering her question, the unnamed man revealed what he'd hidden behind him, Elspeth's leg wrapped tightly in one hand. We froze in shock at the sight of Elspeth's leg in the man's grip. He had been hiding nearby, watching us, waiting for the right opportunity to strike. Panic coursed through everyone, even Elspeth who couldn't find the words as fear invaded her eyes. It hurts, she whispered. We took a moment to process our options while recognizing that if we tried to fight back, it could end disastrously. We decided to call for help but realized that there was no service in the area, so we couldn't just dial 911. 
Our only other choice was to go back to camp and hope someone who worked at the park had a walkie-talkie or some emergency communication device. As Nikolai and Trudy tried to engage the man with subtle conversation, attempting to distract him without alerting him of our intentions, I snuck away with Fletcher back towards our campsite. Time seemed to slow down as we hustled towards safety. Upon returning, we quickly explained the situation to others and acquired a walkie-talkie from a park ranger we found. We notified them about the man terrorizing our group and Elspeth being in danger. Help was on the way. Just as we were about to head back with reinforcements, we saw Nikolai and Trudy running towards us. They told us that Elspeth managed to twist away from the man's grip, and he had fled when he realized they were outnumbered and sensed that help might be coming. With relief washing over us, knowing that Elspeth was safe but conscious of not letting the guard down, we continued on our retreat with more awareness of our surroundings. The next morning arrived with no sign of the mysterious man. It appeared that he was gone for good. Park rangers, realizing someone had been stalking their campsites and contaminating their water source, activated an investigation. The aftermath was grim, though. Elspeth had sustained serious injuries to her leg, requiring medical attention. It turns out that others had noticed the man during our trip as well. Two tourists from San Francisco had seen him lurking near a lake, and another group from Chicago reported finding the decomposed carcass of an animal in a camping area. Although our vacation was cut short, we left with the satisfaction of knowing the threat had vanished for now. Injured but alive, Elspeth bade us farewell while leaving in an ambulance provided by the park rangers. We exchanged contact information with her and silently vowed to keep in touch. On the drive home, we couldn't help but think about the man who invaded our vacation. He still remained a mystery that may never be unraveled. With no other motives or evidence to tie him to a reason behind his horrific actions, he faded into obscurity like a forgotten urban legend, leaving us all with a haunting reminder of our brush with pure evil. The aroma of burning wood and the sound of crickets surrounded me as I sat with my friends around our makeshift campfire. It was July 2002, and we were on a road trip in an RV through the stunning landscapes of Montana. We laughed as Grady, the oldest in the group, told yet another awful joke. Hey Grady, do you have any real stories for us? We've had enough with these jokes. I said while laughing. Grady rubbed his bearded chin and glanced around at us. Aaron, Sabrina, Helen, Clarice, Marvin, and myself, before settling in to tell us a real story. All right, all right, he said, looking serious. I heard about this place where we're camping tonight. The six of us listened intently while roasting marshmallows. They say there's a man who roams around this area and goes after lone campers when they least expect it. His voice dropped to a whisper. Apparently, he's an escaped convict who's been on the run for years. We all exchanged glances, unsure if he was joking or not. Sabrina chuckled nervously. Do you really expect us to believe that? She asked. You're just trying to scare us. You don't have to believe me, Grady replied solemnly. But let's just say I'm more worried about our food supply than any ghost stories. We laughed in agreement and continued to enjoy our night around the campfire. Eventually, we all headed into the RV for the night. As I climbed into my sleeping bag on the top bunk, Sabrina's question tugged at my curiosity. Was there really an escaped convict roaming around? In the stillness of night, when most had fallen asleep to their own muted fears, I heard it, 
a low scraping sound against the RV wall outside. Then came soft footsteps, circling the vehicle. I held my breath and listened for any other sounds, but there was nothing. Struggling to sleep, I decided to take a walk outside and check things out, just for my peace of mind. I tiptoed through the dimly lit RV, careful not to wake anyone else, and crept outside. The night was clear, and the moon cast eerie silhouettes of trees onto the ground. Taking a deep breath, I walked around the campsite. It was then that something caught my eye, a tall figure roaming beyond the tree lean. The man seemed to be taking an intense interest in our RV. I tried calling out to him through my incredulity. Hey, are you lost? The figure stopped abruptly but didn't reply. Instead, he cautiously stepped out of the shadows. The man was incredibly thin, with long limbs that seemed disproportionate to his body. He had unkempt hair, and his clothes were dirty and tattered. But it was his eyes that sent shivers down my spine. They were hollow and held a dark malice far beyond anything I had ever seen. A part of me believed Grady's story right then and there. I dug around in my pocket for my phone to call for help, only to suddenly realize the lack of reception here in this wilderness area made that impossible. In a panic-stricken haste, I sprinted back toward the RV as fast as I could, every fiber of my being knowing that this man meant us harm. Just as I reached the door and fumbled with shaking hands for its handle, I heard footsteps racing closer. As Helen opened the door from within, noticing my frantic motions outside, others who stirred at all the commotion became more aware of reality with each passing second. Guys! Get up! Now! There's a man outside! I shouted through gasping breaths. Sabrina and Aaron were first to their feet, concern etched across their exhausted faces. What? Are you sure? Yes. He fits Grady's description. I just knew we needed to get away the moment I saw him. I explained, terror filling my voice. We didn't waste any more time. The RV's engine roared to life, and we sped off into the night, leaving our sight far behind us. My friends and I were frozen in fear as the headlights illuminated the distance ahead. The decision to leave our campsite was unanimous. If the dangerous man from Grady's story was indeed real, we wanted nothing to do with him. We headed into the nearest town, and as soon as we arrived, we found the police station and explained our situation. They listened to our story with concern and seriousness. A few officers immediately went out to investigate, while we were left in a waiting room, anxious for any news. After what felt like hours, an officer returned with an update on the case. The investigation revealed evidence that someone had been staying near our campsite before we arrived. Old food packaging, a makeshift bed, traces of basic tools, confirming our worst fears that we had encountered an individual with malicious intent who roamed around the area. But the most chilling information came when they questioned nearby locals about any suspicious activity or individuals. A man matching our description was known by local townspeople, who said he'd been acting unpredictably for months and seemed haunted by some intense personal troubles. His violent tendencies had erupted recently, resulting in conflicts with other people. We were distraught to hear this news but felt relieved that he couldn't hurt us anymore. To keep us safe, the police recommended that we leave town entirely and find another place to stay. Feeling shaken from the entire ordeal, my friends and I decided that it would be best if we returned home or found somewhere else entirely removed from this terrifying encounter. We hopped back in the RV and drove away from the town that had become synonymous with fear for us. As we journeyed onwards, my friends and I experienced a wide range of emotions, 
relief being foremost among them. We discussed how fortunate we were to have found help and escaped unscathed before things got worse. Days later, on the road trip back home, Aaron received a phone call from an unknown number. He put it on speakerphone so all of us could hear. As soon as the voice crackled through, we knew exactly who it was. It was the police investigator who dealt with our case. Apparently, they had arrested the man we had encountered, only to later discover he was a wanted killer. The man had been on the run from authorities for weeks after having committed multiple murders. The police had been closing in on him but never managed to find him until our report provided them with critical information they needed to finally locate and capture him. Horrified, we thanked the investigator for his hard work, and he wished us well, advising us to continue being cautious throughout the rest of our trips. The reality of how close we'd come to a genuine threat haunted us long after we returned home. My friends and I often reflect on how things might have unfolded differently that night if we hadn't reacted as quickly as we did or failed to find help when we most needed it. Weeks later, news of the man's trial spread through media outlets, putting that harrowing chapter to rest once and for all. We can only hope that our RV trip's near-tragic encounter allows others to tread more carefully during their travels while making sure they're always aware of their surroundings, no matter where they are. As I poured creamer into my lukewarm cup of morning coffee, I suddenly realized I had forgotten to bring the ice cooler on our camping trip. Considering how meticulous my planning had been, this momentary lapse had been the most comical yet unfortunate incident of our little adventure so far. It was September 2021 when my old high school buddy, Oscar Harrington, and I decided to camp on the outskirts of a small Missouri town in our RV. It had been weeks since we last met, and we needed a break from the hustle and bustle of city life. Your classic bonding story, except as it unfolded, it quickly deviated from anything close to normal. The town was picturesque, nestled between rolling hills and a dense forest teeming with curious woodland creatures. We parked the camper near an old abandoned barn that had seen better days and started setting up our site. As the sun dipped below the horizon, we lit a fire pit outside the RV and breathed in the crisp autumn air. Our conversations were lighthearted and nostalgic, full of shared memories filled with laughter. Then, at some point during our stargazing chat about old classmates, we heard what sounded like soft footsteps approaching nearby. Initially dismissing it as a deer or raccoon passing through, we continued our conversation while Oscar tore foil wrap sheets for barbecuing potatoes. After all, that's what passes as gourmet during an RV camping trip. But the sounds persisted and strangely grew louder. Feeling uneasy, we decided to take precaution by packing up our gear around us and leaving just enough fire left to keep us company that night. Rustling leaves then revealed a man slowly materializing from the darkness surrounding us. The amber glow of the fire etched out his scruffy beard, unkempt hair, and tattered clothing that hung on his gaunt frame. His piercing blue eyes seemed to size us up without concern, as though we were insignificant intruders into his domain. Although he didn't say a word, we couldn't help but feel as if he was also laughing at our predicament. Speechlessly, Oscar and I stared helplessly at this menacing figure, wondering why someone like him would be wandering around such a remote location on foot. As the man's stare intensified, I concluded that dialing 911 wasn't just for desperate emergencies, but considering the non-existent cell reception in this area, our options felt limited. Erm, um, so are you from around here? Oscar stammered nervously, 
attempting to break the unnerving silence. This only seemed to amuse the stranger more as his lips curled sinisterly. In an instant, the man lunged towards us, swinging what appeared to be a rusted lead pipe in his hand. Searing pain shot through my leg as it connected with my calf, the bitter irony being that we were miles away from medical help. It dawned on us that this nameless stranger had no qualms about causing serious harm if given the chance. In a desperate effort to protect ourselves, Oscar and I crawled back into the RV and locked it down tighter than Fort Knox. The man continued to circle our campsite menacingly, his breathing heavy and erratic, like a predator stalking its prey. We held our breaths and prayed for some form of divine intervention while we scrambled through the first aid kit for something, anything, to fasten my injured leg. The agonizing cries that ripped through me with each movement seemed only to fuel our attacker's sadistic pleasure. As we remained trapped in our RV, the realization hit us that we had no choice but to face our fears and confront our attacker. Oscar glanced at me nervously, and I nodded in agreement. We both knew that we couldn't stay caged up forever. Sooner or later, we had to act and take back control of our situation. Quietly, we rifled through the RV, searching for anything that might serve as a makeshift weapon. I found a cast iron frying pan in the kitchen area, while Oscar armed himself with a tire iron. Neither was ideal for self-defense, but at least it was something. We waited until the man outside had circled around to the opposite side of the RV before slowly cracking open the door. Our hearts pounded as we stepped out into the night air, trying not to make a sound. As soon as the door shut behind us, we split up and hid behind trees on either side of the campsite. We could hear the man's heavy breathing as he continued stalking around our home on wheels. The minutes ticked by agonizingly as we waited for an opportunity to strike. Then, suddenly, we saw him. His back was turned as he headed toward a cluster of bushes near our makeshift barrier. Taking advantage of his momentary distraction, Oscar sprinted towards him from his hiding spot, tire iron in hand. He swung with all his might at the man's leg, eliciting a guttural cry of pain from our attacker. As Oscar dealt his blow, I joined him in confronting and subduing this stranger who threatened our lives. Together, we pinned him down, my injured leg making it difficult to apply much force. We've got you now, Oscar hissed under his breath as he tied our attacker's hands together with some spare cord lying nearby in desperation. Once restrained, we finally got a good look at him. His skin was covered in dirt and sweat, and his clothes were torn and muddied. The man's eyes were still wild with a sense of crazy determination. We decided to keep watch over this intruder while we waited for daylight to break. The hours dragged on in a tense standoff until, finally, the first light of morning peeked through the trees. Oscar mustered the courage to ask him, Who are you? And why did you attack us? The man remained silent, his gaze remaining eerily steadfast. Frustration mounted as our questions went unanswered, but we soon realized it was better to put some distance between us and this unsettling individual. Carefully, we made our way back to the RV, keeping the stranger restrained nearby. We grabbed our things and decided it was best to drive back into town to seek help from the authorities. We didn't know who he was or what he wanted, but at least now we knew this violent character's reign of terror wouldn't continue any longer. With the unknown assailant in tow, we embarked on the slow journey back to civilization. But as we traveled along the remote road, a disquieting thought loomed over us. If our attacker had been lurking around the area for some time, how many more campers might have crossed paths with him before us? Were there other victims like us stranded in the vast wilderness? 
The thought consumed us as we plodded on, desperate for answers. I had just zipped up my tent, grateful for the thermos of hot cocoa my hands were wrapped around, when a faint scream echoed through the trees. At that moment, I suspected nothing strange. After all, people often played pranks or got spooked during camping trips. But then it happened again, this time louder, more gut-wrenching. I couldn't ignore it any longer. It was June 2012, and I, along with my friends Michael and Ben, were camping in Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. Our RV served as our home base while we explored the park's numerous hiking trails and picturesque landscapes, excited to unwind from our hectic city lives. The sun was setting as we sat around the campfire. We joked about ghosts and shared stories about our lives outside of this trip. Hey Greg, how's it going with Susan? Michael teased. Still head over heels for her? Are you sure she hasn't broken your heart yet? Shut up, I retorted playfully. I'll let you know that we're going strong. She even has a surprise waiting for me when I get back. This trip was meant to be fun, not terrifying. Ben joked as he pretended to hide his face in horror. We laughed, but in truth, something felt off about the night. Just then... We heard another scream amidst our laughter and fell silent, not even daring to breathe as we tried to process what had just happened. Guys, what if someone's actually hurt? Ben asked hesitantly. We made a quick decision to stick together and cautiously moved in the direction of the screams, using only the dim light of our flashlights to guide us mostly so as not to draw any unwanted attention from wildlife. The darkness swallowed us up whole as we ventured deeper into the woods. The atmosphere grew heavier with each passing minute, and I detected a faint smell of iron in the air. We stumbled upon something that we never could have prepared for. A girl lay on the ground, her body bruised and battered. Her face was frozen in an eternal scream. We need to call for help, Ben yelled, but our cell phones had no service. We should move back to the RV. It's our best hope for contacting the outside world, I asserted. With no other option, we made a conscious decision to leave her there so we could get help. As Michael and Ben ran ahead, I took one last glance at the girl, noticing the footprints leading away from her body large and undoubtedly male, my entire being tensed as if struck by lightning. Returning to the RV, with zero visibility in this eerie darkness, we couldn't help but feel like something was watching us, a presence waiting for its next prey. I felt overwhelmed with nauseating dread. Something was definitely wrong here. Though we were eager to find help for the girl, None of U.S. could shake off an uneasy sense that we had just made ourselves easy targets. The once safe confines of our RV now seemed to be a haven that would only harbor more terror. Once inside, Ben grabbed hold of the CB radio and attempted to contact anyone who might hear us. His voice broke as he reported what we had found, describing in excruciating detail the girl's battered state and our vulnerability while stranded in this desolate wilderness. Moments later, a chilling response crackled over the radio. She isn't the first. He's still out there. Our eyes widened in fear when suddenly we heard heavy footsteps approaching outside, growing closer every second. It dawned on me that death lingered just inches away from us, so near that we could sense its terrifying presence and I knew without a doubt that our worst nightmares were about to unfold right before our very eyes. We couldn't waste any more time. Michael, Ben, and I frantically locked the RV's doors and windows while trying to keep our panic under control. 
the heavy footsteps outside stopped, but we knew the assailant was still nearby. Keep the lights off, Michael whispered, carefully placing his flashlight on the counter. We crouched down behind the counter, hoping that we remained out of sight. The silence was unbearable, but it also allowed us to hear when a vehicle approached in the distance. It was the sound of salvation, a police car. Ben must have managed to get through to them on the CB radio after all. The flashing blue and red lights illuminated the thin curtains of our RV. But we didn't dare move. Even though help had arrived, we couldn't be certain if it was truly safe for us yet. Suddenly, we heard gunshots from outside, followed by a deep guttural roar. The assailant outside had been discovered by the police officers. More gunshots echoed through the night sky. Somebody was undoubtedly hurt. As quickly as it began, the commotion subsided. We hesitated for a moment, wondering if it was safe enough to finally step outside. The approaching knock on our RV door was unexpected but welcomed. It's the police. It's safe now, a voice announced. Emerging from our hiding spot, we hesitantly unlocked and opened the door to find two grim-faced officers standing before us with their guns drawn. They filled us in on what had happened. They'd found and shot a tall man who'd attempted to attack them when they arrived at our location. Frustration mixed with relief overwhelmed us as we tried to process everything that had taken place in such a short amount of time. The officers escorted us back into their patrol cars, where they asked us questions about the events that led us here, about discovering the girl and trying to make contact for help. During our discussion, another officer walked towards us, carrying a large backpack. It belonged to the attacker and was found near where he lay lifeless. The contents of the backpack were chilling, photographs and notes detailing his previous victims, most of whom matched the girl's gruesome fate we had discovered earlier in the woods. It was bone-chilling to think about how close we had come to becoming his next victims. But it wasn't until later that we learned the full truth about just how close we were to death. At the police station... While giving our statements, an officer showed us the most recent note found in the attacker's backpack. It listed our names, Michael, Ben, and my own, scribbled beside an icy phrase. Their cries for help will fall on deaf ears. It felt as if a vice gripped our hearts. He'd known who we were before our encounter in the woods and deliberately interfered with our cell phone signals to isolate us from help. The gravity of our narrow escape left us speechless. The officers praised Ben for managing to reach them on the CB radio when all hope seemed lost. That seemingly insignificant choice very likely saved all of our lives that night. However, even after our attacker met his end, we knew life would never be the same again, not for us and not for the other families who suffered unimaginable losses at his hands. I was in the middle of rolling up another marshmallow-filled esmore when the sound of shattering glass pierced the evening calm like a needle. I dropped the concoction and grabbed a flashlight, rushing out of the RV to investigate. Timothy! What's going on? My friend Rosalind inquired, emerging from her tent. I don't know, I replied, eyeing the broken beer bottle by a nearby tree. But this wasn't here five minutes ago. We were camping in an isolated area within Yellowstone National Park. It was supposed to be a tranquil escape from our daily routines. Instead, it had taken an unexpected turn towards danger. April and Peter went on that hike hours ago. They should have been back by now, Rosalind said nervously, browsing her phone despite having no signal. Did you hear that? 
Peter's voice stammered suddenly from behind her as he stumbled into view, visibly shaken. Guys, we need to leave now. What's going on? I asked, helping my exhausted friend regain his composure. April emerged from the darkness too, her face pale and her eyes wide open with terror. We saw there was someone. He had blood on his hands. He... Their words felt like an ice-cold stab to my heart. This hadn't been some overenthusiastic camper with a beer bottle. There was something far more menacing lurking around us. We piled into the RV, panicked breaths filling the small space as we barricaded the doors shut with anything we could find. Suitcases. Chairs. It wasn't long before we heard someone, or something, banging against the door repeatedly sending thunderous vibrations through our makeshift barricade. As adrenaline surged through my veins, I peered cautiously through a gap in the curtains. He was an ordinary-looking man in his late thirties, dressed in tattered clothes with broken glass embedded in the soles of his shoes. His face was a mask of malicious intent, and his eyes were filled with hatred and cruelty as he tried to wrench open the door. Suddenly, he stopped and turned his attention towards the thick forest canopy. Without warning, he picked up an axe from among the clutter of camping tools and started charging towards the trees as though mindlessly driven by an unseen force. April squeaked out, I told you I saw him back there. What's his deal? I pulled her back from the window. We need to formulate a plan before he comes back. Let's break our phones for sharp pieces and take any blunt objects just in case we need to defend ourselves. Just then, the RV began to shake violently, as though it were being struck by a giant. The sounds of breaking dishes and chipping would echo through its walls, surrounding us with a cacophony of chaos. What if it's him? Peter mumbled under his breath as we scrambled for makeshift weapons. This guy could be some sort of uncaught serial killer. We might be next. Peter's words hung heavily in the air, suffocating our hope like a noose. Rosalind clasped her hands around her pocket knife and muttered bitterly, If we die tonight, we're going down fighting. The pounding persisted relentlessly on the RV walls sending fracture lines spider-webbing across the windows until there was only one choice left before us, flee or stay cornered like sitting ducks. We formulated a plan. Peter would launch himself at our attacker using his belt as some form of whip to temporarily blind them, while April made her way around behind him, wielding a burning hot frying pan from over the fire pit. I would hold on to my can of bug spray that I'd found lying beneath my seat in case another opportunity arose, while Rosalind kept vigilant with her pocket knife. As we gathered our makeshift weapons and assessed the situation, it became clear that calling for help was not an option. Our phones had no signal in this remote location, and the nearest town was miles away. We knew we had to rely on ourselves and stick together if we were to survive the night. Peter readied his belt while April clutched the scalding frying pan, their faces a mix of determination and fear. Rosalind wielded her pocket knife, and I grasped the can of bug spray tightly. We took strategic positions near the RV door, waiting for our attacker to return. The moment stretched on and the anticipation heightened with every passing second. When he reappeared at last, he seemed even more menacing than before, and his face contorted with rage as he wielded his axe. His sweaty brow was furrowed, and strands of greasy hair stuck to his forehead as he approached our fragile haven. Without further delay, Peter sprang into action, lashing out with his belt aimed at the attacker's face. Simultaneously, April maneuvered herself behind him and swung her frying pan with all her might against his skull. The man stumbled but did not fall. The axe in his hand sliced through the air, 
narrowly missing Peter's arm as he backed away in terror, our make-believe weapons doing little to subdue him. Rosalind rushed forward then, pocket knife in hand, aiming for any exposed flesh she could find. To her dismay, the man caught her wrist before she could reach him. With Herculean force, he flung her aside like a rag doll onto the ground. She lay there motionless, blood pooling beneath her head. This enraged me beyond belief. I couldn't comprehend what kind of person could brutalize another human being, let alone four strangers camping in the woods. Gathering all my courage and rage, I lunged at our attacker. The bug spray could point directly toward his face like a makeshift flamethrower. The liquid chemical shot out in a harsh stream and hit him square in the eyes, creating temporary blindness. Howling in pain, he dropped the axe and staggered backward. We seized our chance and ran as fast as we could through the dark forest. We did not stop to think or catch our breath. We had just one goal, to get as far away from him as possible. Hours later, we stumbled upon a dirt road, exhausted and battered but alive. When a truck driver picked us up and drove us to the nearest town, we explained what had transpired in shaky voices. A police squad was immediately dispatched to search for the man who had terrorized us, and we discovered countless other campers before us. Through meticulous investigation and media attention garnered by our harrowing story, they finally caught the man-man, a former logger by the name of Gregory Bloody Axe, Wilson. They discovered that he had been living off-grid in those woods for years, following a grisly series of murders that took the lives of several co-workers at his logging company. For reasons unknown yet speculated by psychologists, Gregory became consumed by bloodlust. He stalked and terrorized campers visiting the area while evading capture for all those years, until that fateful night when we encountered him amidst our own quiet getaway. Despite our losses, for Rosalind did not survive her injuries, we were thankful to escape with our lives and bring an end to a reign of terror that had haunted those woods for years. Though shaken by memories of that gruesome encounter, we gradually moved on with renewed gratitude for life's fragility, and an unbreakable bond formed in survival against all odds. It was a sight I had never seen before, the kind that would make anyone's heart skip a beat in terror. The crisp autumn skies painted with hues of orange and red signaled the start of my much-awaited solo camping trip. I had chosen Bar Harbor in Maine as my destination, partly due to the beautiful foliage that graced the landscape and partly because of its relative obscurity. A few weeks prior, I had purchased an RV for this very occasion, a big purchase but one I hoped would allow me to explore the world outside my monotonous office job. After quitting my position at Dean and Whitaker LLP, I couldn't wait to leave all the mundane trappings behind. I had been warned by some locals that September was known for unusual happenings. Even a couple of campers had disappeared without a trace. But I was never one for superstitions, so I shrugged it off as nothing more than folklore churned out by bored small-town folk. The trip started out fantastically well. Roaming the lush forests, hiking the rocky hills, and taking in breathtaking ocean views, pure bliss. From time to time, weird eerie sounds leaked from between dense trees but I brushed it off as wild animals or overactive imagination. One evening, while grilling freshly caught fish over an open fire, I decided to take a quick walk around the campsite before retiring for the night. Wandering into the woods under fading sunlight, I stumbled upon Caleb Durnham, another RV camper who'd parked his vehicle not too far from mine. Additionally alarming was that he appeared somewhat disoriented and dazed. 
As we exchanged pleasantries, he voiced his bewilderment about finding himself miles away from where he'd been just moments ago. Pondering over his predicament, we wondered if perhaps we were lost, but after confirming our coordinate readings on our phones, all doubts dissipated. Amidst the confusion, we shared our travel experiences and eventually retired to our respective RVs. Later that night, tapping noises on my RV's window roused me from a deep slumber. I blinked sleep from my eyes and peered outside the glass, and what I saw is something I can never unsee. A man with razor-thin gray hair, wild, unblinking eyes, elongated fingernails, and a sickly grin was pressed against the window, staring right back at me. The sheer terror that radiated through my veins made me immobile for a few moments. When my senses returned, I quickly slammed up against the door lock, trying everything to keep that grotesque apparition out of my RV. My desperate attempt to call 911 met an untimely end due to weak reception. As my brain raced to find a rational explanation for this horrifying encounter, it dawned on me that the antagonist did not exhibit even a hint of emotion or intent, just tapping his nails listlessly on the glass. The steady, rhythmic taps started to take their toll on me until, at some point, they suddenly ceased. Was he gone? Cautiously peering through the window curtains again, I spotted Caleb emerging from his RV armed with an axe in hand. He'd also heard the taps and quickly caught sight of our unwelcome visitor lurking in the darkness. Caleb, axe in hand, approached the eerie man cautiously but determinately. As he drew near, the man turned and attacked him, mercilessly slashing at Caleb with his grotesque fingernails. Blood spattered onto the ground around them as Caleb fought to defend himself, struggling to hold on to the axe. I watched in horror, unable to move or even call out for help. The sickening sound of flesh ripping echoed through the night air while I felt consumed by fear and helplessness. At last, fueled by a surge of adrenaline, I burst from my RV and sprinted towards the campground's main office. The office seemed like a mile away as I ran through the darkness, my mind racing with fear for Caleb's life. What was that, man? Was he even human? Reaching the office, I pounded on the door desperately, begging whoever was inside to let me in. A nervous park ranger opened the door, startled by my frantic appearance. I breathlessly explained the situation as best I could while urging him to call for help immediately. Before long, we heard distant sirens approaching. Relief washed over me. Hope that Caleb might still be alive began to grow within me. A few moments later, police officers arrived, with paramedics following close behind. I led them to where Caleb had faced off against the terrifying attacker. As we reached the scene of the bloody struggle, we found no trace of the man with cold eyes and razor-like nails. Only Caleb lay there, battered and barely breathing his life hanging by a thread. Paramedics rushed to his aid while police asked me some questions about what had happened, but my account seemed insufficient for an explanation of what we'd seen. While Caleb was taken away on a stretcher and loaded into an ambulance, several officers remained behind to search for clues or leads about our tormentor. Scouring every inch of our camping area but finding nothing, it seemed we had no way of holding our attacker responsible. Days later, I learned that Caleb had somehow survived the ordeal despite sustaining severe injuries. Our friendship was cemented by these disturbing events, and we stayed in contact after we left the campground. As it turned out, our attacker had escaped without a trace leaving only the painful memories of his assault and a nagging question that haunted our thoughts. Who, or what, was this malicious entity? Old stories from the area spoke of a hermit living deep in those woods for decades. 
Eyewitness accounts describe him as a soulless creature with unimaginable strength and animalistic instincts. Possibly driven mad by isolation or worse, this man now preyed on unsuspecting campers and travelers, ensuring that no one who encountered him would ever sleep soundly again. Though the police and other authorities never corroborated these claims, Caleb and I knew what we had witnessed was not the result of fever dreams or an overactive imagination. We decided to leave the investigation to others while focusing on our recovery and moving forward with our lives. Our friend Marco, who loved investigating paranormal events and legends, became intrigued by our account of the horrific encounter. Determined to uncover more about this elusive menace, he ventured into the woods and continued searching for answers long after Caleb and I had given up hope. Months later, when Marco finally returned from his investigation, he confided in us that he'd found enough evidence pointing towards an even more chilling conclusion than that of a hermit gone mad. He claimed to have discovered an identical series of gruesome attacks dating back more than two centuries, all originating from those very same woods near RV site number 39. Shocked at this revelation, we gasped in disbelief as the grim truth behind our horrifying encounter slowly dawned on us. The monstrous assailant who terrorized us that night was not merely a human criminal, but may have been an ageless supernatural force that had walked among us since time immemorial. Now, years later, Caleb and I have rebuilt our lives knowing that something sinister wanders the woods near that remote campground, forever leaving us haunted by the grim mystery of RV Site Number 39. The brisk, cool October air filled my nostrils as I inhaled deeply. What's better than the smell of bacon on a crisp autumn morning? I wondered, grinning at my fellow campers. We'd been camping in our RV on the outskirts of Moab, Utah, for only two days, and we were already having a fantastic time. My friends, Norbert Wainwright and Deanna Caruso, laughed at my comment. Norbert was no chef, but he made quite the skilled cook during this adventure. Camping brought out everyone's hidden talents. We spent much of the first day exploring Canyonlands National Park, soaking in the strikingly beautiful landscape. For tonight's entertainment, I had a surprise up my sleeve to liven things up. Classic ghost stories. Little did we know that our fireside tales would become intertwined with something far more sinister. As evening fell upon us, we gathered around a blazing campfire within a circle of logs we'd fashioned as makeshift chairs. The laughter died down as I hoisted myself onto one of the logs and kicked off the storytelling. What began as light-hearted fictional horror quickly descended into more terrifying territory when Deanna shared her friend's chilling experience meeting a real-life serial killer at a bar. Just as she came to her gruesome conclusion, we were interrupted by distant screams. It sounded like someone needed help. We exchanged looks of concern before grabbing our flashlights and heading toward the source of the commotion just beyond our campsite. Surrounded by dense trees and shrubs that dampened the light from my flashlight, I found myself questioning why we ventured out here without my phone or any means of contacting emergency services. Just then, Norbert called out to us. He had found something. Shards of broken glass littered the forest floor beneath a ransacked RV just ten feet away from me, a sight that shook me to the core. This was more than just campfire pranks. Something terrible had happened here. Continuing deeper into the forest, we stumbled on an equally horrifying scene, a man bound to a tree and gagged. His eyes were wide with terror, staring off into the darkness away from us. Before we could free him or even speak, 
Our attention was drawn to the movement in the shadows nearby and the cackling laughter that followed. There was no mistaking it. That's where he was. The attacker is hidden behind a mask of darkness, waiting for an opportune time to close in on his prey. Cold sweat seeped down my back as I trembled, grasping my friend's hands tightly while scanning the tree lean for any glimpses of movement. As we cautiously approached the terror-stricken man, the laughter grew louder and echoed through the night. Then suddenly, all went quiet. The silence weighed heavily on our ears as we struggled to process what had just happened. What do we do? We can hardly see anything. Deanna whispered shakily as her flashlight flickered ominously dimmer. Horror surged through me as I realized I'd left our backup batteries back at our own RV in our haste to help this stranger. We need to find our way back, I replied tensely. Leaving him alone might allow us to return with help. Norbert nodded gravely, scanning around one last time before we turned back toward our RV, praying that whatever remained hidden in those shadows wouldn't decide to follow us back. As we retraced our steps quickly and cautiously, I couldn't shake the fear gnawing at my insides. My breathing grew heavier with each step closer to safety, but that gnawing sense of dread thickened too. Then, Deanna shrieked suddenly as she tripped over what appeared at first glance to be nothing more than a protruding root. However, on closer inspection, her flashlight beam revealed a trail of blood smeared across the leaves and dirt, leading parallel to our path back to safety. A frantic search of the bushes showed no sign of what or who might have just passed through. With our lungs heaving and every nerve screaming for us to turn back, we pushed onward, moving as one trembling unit, inch by inch closer. Suddenly, we came face to face with him, the monster, the phantom that had been lurking just out of sight. Upon seeing the man in the shadows, we were frozen with fear. He was tall, lean, and muscular. His long, dark hair was unkempt and covered his face, only revealing a sinister, twisted smile. In his hand was a large, bloody knife, which glistened under the flickering beams of our flashlights. As terror overwhelmed us, Deanna managed to choke out a single question. Who are you? The man didn't answer. Instead, he lunged at us, aiming his knife towards Norbert's chest. We scattered in different directions instinctively. Help! I screamed as loud as I could, praying someone nearby would hear our cries for help. Deanna took off towards the RV park's office while Norbert and I sprinted back in the direction of our RV. Our hearts raced as we desperately tried to reach safety. Why didn't he call for help? Norbert panted as we ran. I don't know, I replied between breaths. Maybe he just wanted to protect us. We finally reached our RV and rushed inside, locking the door behind us. Deanna had gotten through to the park's office and had informed them of the situation. They assured her that they'd called the local authorities to come and help immediately. We waited in tense silence until flashing red and blue lights lit up the night outside our windows. The local authorities arrived quickly, searching the area thoroughly while speaking with each of us in turn about what we experienced. Despite their best efforts, they were unable to locate the man in the shadows that night. They did, however, discover the tortured body of the stranger who'd begged for our help. He'd been fatally stabbed multiple times before being hung from a tree with nearly identical ligature marks around his neck as other victims reportedly found in nearby areas during previous months. The realization that someone dangerous had been haunting this area for quite some time sent chills down my spine. The man in the shadows had been listening, watching, and waiting for the perfect moment to strike, and we had unknowingly walked right into his trap. 
As we packed up our belongings the next day and prepared to leave, I shuddered at the thought of all the danger we narrowly avoided. The man in the shadows was still out there, leaving a trail of pain and suffering as he continued his hunting spree. I couldn't help but wonder how many more unsuspecting victims would fall prey to this merciless attacker, and for how long would it take before he once again faded back into darkness like a twisted nightmare? As the days turned into weeks, life began to return to some semblance of normality. We avoided the news articles that featured eerie tales of the man in shadows stalking campsites and RV parks. It was a chilling reminder that even with our best efforts, danger could still be lurking just outside of you. Despite not feeling entirely safe anymore, knowing that someone so twisted was still out there, we had no choice but to carry on. We found comfort in each other, discussing what happened and sharing our insecurities. In hushed tones during private moments together, we spoke about that stranger who braved his last moments to warn us about the danger in those woods. Even though we couldn't save him, he undoubtedly saved us. He didn't call for help because he knew it wouldn't come in time for him. Instead, he prioritized saving others from a grisly fate. His sacrifice would not be forgotten. Deanna began researching missing persons cases in areas with reported sightings of our attacker and used her skills to bring their stories to light, hoping it might save others from a similar fate. Meanwhile, Norbert started attending self-defense courses, ensuring that if something like this were ever to happen again, he'd be better prepared. And I continued to document and share our story, ensuring the memory of that stranger's sacrifice remained alive. By doing so, I hoped to keep others vigilant, even while the man in the shadows lived on, lurking just out of sight. It was just a regular weekday when I decided to spend some alone time with nature and rustled up my belongings to go on an impromptu camping trip for the weekend. My name is Otis Hildebrand, which was rare but never really raised any eyebrows. Packing my bags and stocking my RV with food, water, and other necessities, I embarked on a journey toward the Ruby Mountains in Nevada. The weather was warm and the skies were clear. What could go wrong? While driving towards my destination, I saw various landscapes, marveling at their beauty and feeling instantly relaxed, knowing this weekend would be full of serenity. Arriving at my campsite just as the sun started making its slow descent, I pulled into a spacious clearing amid dense forest cover. As I set about organizing stuff inside the RV, I struck up a conversation with a nearby camper named Baldwin Leonis. He mentioned how he had been camping here since childhood and couldn't resist making yearly trips to this area. Cracking up some jokes about bears stealing fish from campers to our mutual amusement, we soon ended our light-hearted banter as it was getting late. Later that night, I sat outside my RV sipping hot cocoa as the mesmerizing sounds of crickets played their nocturnal symphony. From afar, the twinkling stars appeared closer than ever through the swaying branches of tall trees wrapped in darkness. Shortly before midnight, just as sleep began tugging at my eyelids, an ear-piercing scream shattered the calmness of the night. My heart pounded rapidly as another scream resonated throughout the campsite. I bolted up from my chair and went over to see if everything was all right. I approached Baldwin's campsite only to find him clutching his leg in pain, blood oozing around his fingers, and his face contorted with terror. What happened? I stuttered in shock. It was just a man, I think. He just lunged at me with this twisted, sinister smile on his face. I couldn't see very well, but the man had these wild, 
unkempt hair and bloodshot eyes that bore right through my soul. He explained animatedly, even when my skeptical mind doubted the likelihood of the situation. But Baldwin's wound was no laughing matter. It looked like an animal bite or claw marks from a large creature. I wanted to take him to the hospital and call the authorities, but our cell phones had no signal in this remote vicinity. Being uncertain of the events that had transpired before us, we decided it was best to stay put until daybreak. Leaving Baldwin in my RV, I stepped out to move his car closer to mine. The ambient light from my RV barely illuminated my surroundings. As I fumbled for the car keys Baldwin had given me, I saw what appeared to be an ordinary man who might have been walking through a campsite or on my way back from hiking. The man's features were noticeably rough, those of someone who had spent considerable time outside exposed to harsh weather elements. His unshaven beard and unkempt hair added to his menacing appearance. However, it was his detached expression that unsettled me the most, like he was barely conscious of his own existence. As I stood there, feeling a mix of fear and curiosity, I decided to approach the man, but cautiously. Hey, are you all right? I asked tentatively, trying not to provoke him. He looked at me with those bloodshot eyes, giving no response. Suddenly, his lips stretched into a terrifying grin that sent shivers down my spine as he approached me with quick, erratic movements. Before I could react, he lunged at me, and I narrowly dodged his attack. He stumbled past me, temporarily disoriented. Seizing the opportunity, I sprinted back to my RV. Baldwin! A strange man just attacked me. We need to leave now. Baldwin clenched his teeth in pain as he tried to stand and make it to the driver's seat. I quickly started the engine and began driving away from the campsite. As we left our campsite behind in haste, I worried about the other campers who might not have been aware of this ongoing danger. However, without cell phone reception... There was nothing we could do but warn them when we reached civilization. In the rearview mirror, I noticed that a few other RVs were following us. Clearly, they had faced a similar encounter. It seemed as though this wasn't an isolated incident. The terrifying man was on a rampage. We continued through the night until we reached a small town where we could finally call for help. We urge everyone to connect with local law enforcement and inform them of what just occurred at the once serene campsite. An ambulance arrived quickly at our location to tend to Baldwin's injuries as officers garnered our statements, taking notes on every detail about our bizarre attacker. Soon after that nightmarish experience, reports surfaced about multiple injured campers and peculiar sightings of an unkempt man with bloodshot eyes who terrorized a remote camping ground. Neither the authorities nor anyone had answers, but they began a manhunt for the attacker. It was later discovered that the attacker was a wanted criminal who had been on the run for several years. He had always managed to stay one step ahead of pursuing law enforcement, and had survived by hiding out in remote areas, posing as a disturbed hermit. More sinister aspects of his past came to light, such as a long history of aggressive behavior and psychiatric evaluations. His personal motives remained a mystery. The townspeople paid respects to those involved in the traumatic events, offering support through local resources and mental health organizations. For many of us, the memories of that night would remain etched into our minds, occasionally haunting us but also serving as a testament to our survival instincts. Little did we know, among the injured campers was an undercover detective who had been tracking the mysterious attacker for many years. The bizarre encounters everyone experienced served as a catalyst for finally unmasking him. As more details emerged in the coming days and weeks, 
We hoped for closure so that we could move on from our harrowing experiences. In time, life seemed to return to normalcy, or at least as normal as it could be after such an ordeal. People continued camping in those woods, but with heightened caution and awareness. The detective's expertise and dedication played a significant role in apprehending this individual, who had wreaked havoc on many lives. Knowing that this criminal would no longer be able to harm others provided solace not just to us but also to people in various parts of the region who had faced similar cruelties. The detective's near-death experience at our campsite eventually served as key evidence leading to the arrest and conviction of one of the most sought-after fugitives in recent memory. It was then that we realized how fragile life can be, one moment filled with blissful serenity, innocent laughter, and peaceful nights, another disturbed by violence and horror. That night was a turning point in our lives a startling reminder of the unpredictability of the world we live in and an unforgettable lesson that even amidst nature's beauty, darkness can lurk just around the corner. As I held my breath, the grisly sight before me left me speechless. It was April 2015, and my buddies and I had planned a two-week camping trip to the Santa Fe National Forest in New Mexico. We were all looking for a break from our mundane office jobs, something that would excite us without discussing reports or spreadsheets, just good times under the stars with a few adventurous stories to tell once we got back. We rented an RV large enough to accommodate our motley crew, consisting of me, Glenford Ezekiel, Sandra Johansson, Laverne Shackelford, and Lucretia Whitla. Parking our home on wheels near a serene lake, surrounded by trees and mountain views, we thought the location couldn't be more perfect. On the fourth day of our blissful trip, during an early morning hike through a remote section of the forest, we stumbled across something neither any of us nor even Google could have prepared us for, a severed human finger lying on the ground near our trail. The nail was painted a bright red color that seemed hauntingly out of place amongst nature's muted tones. Who did it belong to? What grisly event had occurred there? Horrified but rational adults we were, we agreed to report our morbid discovery but hesitated due to fear of ruining our well-deserved vacation. Meanwhile, Sandra attempted to lighten everyone's mood with her usual gallows humor. If it's any consolation, she said with a wry grin, at least whoever lost it didn't have much trouble counting down from ten. However creepy this finding was, we naively carried on with our trip. Days went by without any further unnerving incidents. While sitting around the campfire at night, Lucretia suggested that we should sing camping songs, as if to coax our vacation back onto a lighter path. Then one evening, while Laverne and Sandra were in town restocking our supplies, something strange happened. As the sun dipped below the distant mountains, casting eerie shadows across the lake, Lucretia and I heard what sounded like a faint gasp coming from the edge of our campsite. Drawing our flashlights, we discovered fresh blood smeared on a shrub. The blood trailed off into the dark forest but was obscured by the shadows. Heart pounding in an anxious frenzy, I gripped my flashlight tighter with sweaty palms. Lucretia! My voice trembled. Something's wrong. We need to get back inside the RV and lock everything up. She nodded in agreement as we quickly shuffled back to safety. Once inside, we peeked out from behind the curtains like cornered animals scanning for predators. Observing nothing but darkness around us, fear's frosty grip began to constrict tighter around our hearts. As if drawn toward the abyss of terror, my eyes were magnetically attracted to a shape that stopped me cold, a man standing still by our campfire, 
staring right back at me. He was tall, with unkempt, rust-colored hair partially covering his face. Both his clothing and skin appeared slightly discolored from dirt and blood stains. His chilling glare unsettled us deeply, a look that conveyed both anger and malice. I needed to call for help, but then remembered that our phones were left inside Laverne's backpack outside near the fire pit. Our hearts sank as Lucretia whispered, We didn't think this through. In a panic, Lucretia and I decided to hide, hoping that the man would leave soon. We closed all the windows, turned off all the lights, and tried our best not to make any noise. We wanted to call for help, but without our phones, all we could do was wait. The man didn't budge for what felt like an eternity. He stood there motionless, staring at our RV like a predator sizing up its prey. A sickening feeling built in both of us. No help was coming. We needed to get through this ourselves. Our whispered conversation was muted and desperate. If we opened the door and made a run for it, maybe we could distract him long enough for Laverne and Sandra to return from town and realize something was amiss. But as much as we wanted to escape, fear rooted us in place. Suddenly, we saw headlights approaching the campsite in the distance. Laverne and Sandra were back with supplies. Relief surged through us, until we realized they were completely unaware of the looming danger outside. Their unsuspecting arrival threw the night into chaos. The rusty-haired figure quickly grabbed a large rock by the campfire and hurled it at their car with terrifying force. The windshield shattered as Laverne swerved off course, crashing into a nearby tree. Horrified by what happened, adrenaline surged through my veins. I knew that staying in the RV would serve no one. Rapidly unlocking the door and bolting out with Lucretia close behind me, we saw that they were both alive but disoriented from the impact of the crash. Together, we helped them stumble out of their vehicle and caught them up on what had happened in their absence. The sinister intruder had vanished into darkness while we tried to collect ourselves after witnessing such brutality. Sandra mustered every ounce of her strength to let out a shrill scream. The disheveled man reappeared abruptly with fury in his eyes, holding a blood-stained knife. Without thinking, we split up each running in different directions as the man lunged at us. We would run and hide for hours amidst the chaos and fear, constantly on edge, desperate to end the nightmare. Eventually, around the crack of dawn, shrouded in utter exhaustion, we regrouped near a small clearing at the edge of the forest. The deranged attacker finally emerged from hiding. With grime and blood staining his hands and a twisted snarl carved across his face, it was clear that he enjoyed hunting us like this. He stood between us, our RV, and the lake. Our only options were to give in or make one final attempt to get away. Summoning whatever energy we had left, we collectively charged at him in sheer desperation. Tackling him, I managed to wrestle his knife away as Laverne kicked him into the water. We stood there, panting and weary, every inch of our bodies trembling. The ordeal appeared to be over as the man sank below the once glassy waters of the lake, until Lucretia pointed out that he had left something on a large rock near where he had been standing all night. Reluctantly leaving our temporary safety on the shoreline, we peeked at what he had left behind rusty cans of paint and brushes that he had no doubt used to taint his skin and clothing with bloodstains with unnerving precision. Together, we sat there on that rock, waiting for help to arrive. As fingers of light crept into the sky and illuminated his twisted tableau of gore, I couldn't help but wonder how many other people had been tormented by this man before he finally stumbled upon us. But as I surveyed my shaking companions, each exhausted yet alive, I knew one thing for sure, against all odds we survived.
As I sat by the crackling fire, munching on a handful of potato chips, I couldn't help but share a lame joke with my camping buddies. Why do campers always carry duct tape? So one can quack low while patching things up. I burst into laughter as my companions rolled their eyes playfully. This all happened in June 2019 near Mount Shasta in the scenic Northern California region. I was enjoying a cozy RV camping trip with four fellow friends when everything changed. The evening passed by like any other in recent memory, with nothing too exciting. It was serene and quiet interrupted only by the occasional bird song or rustle of the wind's embrace in our little campsite's surroundings. All of us were simultaneously preparing dinner and chatting animatedly about a wide array of subjects. Aaron Richmond, the creative chef in our group, taught me how to prepare foil packs for cooking over the open fire, layers of potatoes, onions, carrots, and her signature blend of mystery spices. Meanwhile, Mark Rutherford was tending to our modest yet cozy campfire. Our laughter drew the attention of a man residing further down the lane at another campsite, Timothy Jasper, who decided to join our conversation. A middle-aged man with deep-set eyes bordered by crow's feet and a scruffy salt and pepper beard came into view while Mark was sharing captivating tales about his latest trekking expedition. We invited Timothy to have dinner with us since he was a solo camper and seemed friendly enough. Over shared meals and tales around our glowing fire pit, we casually got to know this stranger who carried an air of reclusiveness dressed up as politeness. Gradually, however, Unease settled within me as Timothy appeared too interested in our individual stories while revealing little about himself. I couldn't help but shoot furtive glances at the stone-cold expression that accompanied his probing questions, and I felt the transition into deeper discomfort as the night wore on. Far past dinner time, I excused myself to fetch some water from a nearby spigot. As I approached the edge of our campsite carrying a muffled whisper of trepidation, I noticed an unfamiliar gleaming object near Timothy's camping area. Curiosity peaked. I walked towards it and found a trove of intricate knives laid out meticulously on a small table. My heart pounded as adrenaline shot through my body. Shaken, I quickly retreated to my friends and discreetly informed them about my discovery. They, too, were taken aback by my description of Timothy's secretive assortment of sharp blades. We all agreed that it was better not to confront the unsettling stranger and instead excuse ourselves from our own campsite with haste. An unspoken agreement passed between us and we proceeded to pack up our belongings with forced normalcy as though preparing for an innocuous twilight hike. As we made motions towards heading out, Timothy held up a hand covered in nettle sores and inquired nonchalantly about where we were going. Petrified by my observation earlier, I could hardly utter a word and just gestured vaguely toward the forest trailhead. Luckily for me, Aaron chimed in, explaining that we decided on a spontaneous moonlit hike after finishing dinner. Timothy raised an eyebrow but didn't press further. He then mentioned needing something from his own campsite. Since we had a head start from there, Aaron urged us quietly to speed up our pace without looking too suspicious. We made our way down the trail under veiled moonlight as inexplicable fear gripped tighter at each step taken away from Timothy's watchful gaze. As we hurried along, Tim's voice seeped into the woods in quiet pursuit. Hey guys, wait up! As we picked up our pace, Timothy's voice seemed to get louder and more persistent. Guys, wait up! I'm coming too! We exchanged worried glances but continued to move away as fast as we could without making it obvious that we were trying to evade him. Just as we were about to round a bend on the trail, Erin suddenly tripped on a protruding root, sending her crashing to the ground. 
We rushed over to help her up, and that's when Timothy caught up with us. His eyes held an odd glint as he offered a hand to Aaron. Thank you, she said hesitantly, not meeting his gaze. Timothy remained silent and stepped back. The rest of our group exchanged looks of unease, but with no way to escape without causing more suspicion, we pressed onward. By this point, any hope for a peaceful moonlit hike had vanished. Tensions rose as each creak of a branch or rustle of leaves raised the possibility of danger. The silence between our groups seemed insurmountable. Timothy walked behind us, his eyes still casting sharp glances in every direction. Eventually, we reached a fork in the path where we decided to stop for a moment and collect ourselves. In a hushed conference, we decided that splitting up might be our best bet for getting away from Timothy. We're just going to explore this path for a bit, and we'll meet back up with you soon, Alex said quickly. You go on ahead. There's not much time till sunrise. Timothy hesitated but finally nodded in agreement, continuing down the right path while we took the left one. Once we were certain he was out of earshot, we breathed small sighs of relief before heading off in the opposite direction. However, the uncomfortable sensation returned as it started becoming apparent that someone was following us on the trail. Paranoia set in as each shadow seemed to take on ominous shapes, and the moonlit forest transformed into a nightmare. Suddenly, we heard heavy footsteps behind us, followed by a guttural grunt. We couldn't help but glance back, only to see Timothy lunging at us with one of his knives in hand. We screamed and stumbled away from him as fast as our tired legs would carry us. Realizing that we needed help, Erin took out her phone and dialed 911 while running. There's a man attacking us. We're on the trail near our campsite, she shouted, panting heavily. The operator assured her that help was on the way, but it seemed like an eternity as we continued sprinting through the dark forest. Finally, we saw the lights of our campsite in the distance, accompanied by flashing red and blue lights. As we broke through the trees and stumbled into the campsite, police officers emerged to meet us, weapons drawn. He's chasing us. He has a knife. We yelled in unison. The police quickly spread out in search of Timothy as we collapsed onto the ground next to emergency medical personnel. Shaking and exhausted from our terrifying ordeal, we couldn't stop thinking about the fact that it wasn't over until they finally caught him. After what seemed like hours, an officer approached us with an update. We've apprehended your attacker. He had a collection of knives stashed at his campsite, some stained with blood. As shock turned to horror, he continued. We just received word that he escaped from a mental institution two weeks ago. He was serving time for multiple counts of assault. Relief washed over us as the officer walked away to give his team further instructions. We couldn't help but wonder how many others Timothy had hurt before us while holding on to some semblance of relief that his reign of terror was finally at an end. Thankfully, no one in our group was harmed during the ordeal but the harrowing experience would remain etched in our memories forever as a reminder of the unpredictable dangers that can lurk even in places where we least expect them. I was ankle-deep in the murky water of the Everglades when I heard the strangest sound radiating through the humid air. It was June 2021, and I was camping in an RV with my friends, two programmers, Sarah Monroe and Martin Booth, while on a break from work. We thought it would be the perfect opportunity to unwind in nature, a far cry from our daily duties. Was that an alligator? I asked skeptically as my companions looked at each other with raised eyebrows. 
Sarah chuckled nervously. They're more afraid of us than we are of them, right? Besides, we'll be hiking on higher ground soon enough. We continued walking along the muddy path, down a dense patch of marshes that gave way to lush, floor-covered land. Though we were initially hesitant about traversing such an unfamiliar landscape, our nerves gradually subsided as we trekked deeper into Florida's largest subtropical wilderness. One evening, as we chowed down on roasted marshmallows and Martin regaled us with stories from his vast library of old comic books, something caught my eye in the dim light of our campfire. A man stood at the edge of our campsite, half hidden by the shadows of the trees. He was tall and wiry, with unkempt hair and a wild look in his eyes that sent chills up my spine. Before I had a chance to react or say anything to my friends, the man stumbled toward us. Even from a distance, we could see deep gashes covering his arms and face. As he limped into plain view without uttering a word or acknowledging us, it became apparent that something terrible had happened. The stranger collapsed near our fire pit, his clothes torn and barely hanging on to his emaciated frame. In any other situation, I'd have been reluctant even to approach him. But given his disheveled appearance and injuries, I couldn't just let him suffer. As we huddled around him, trying to figure out what to do next, the man managed to croak out one word between labored breaths. Run! Just as our alarmed glances met, we heard a rustling in the bushes nearby. Without wasting another second, Martin and I frantically packed up our belongings while Sarah grabbed the first aid kit from the RV. Our hearts raced with panic as we began our hasty retreat. Our once peaceful camping trip had taken a sinister turn, albeit one that was undeniably captivating and thrilling after days of benign relaxation. What do you think happened to him? Sarah whispered as we stumbled along the dark path our flashlights barely illuminating the way. I don't know, Martin replied in a shaky voice. But I have a feeling that whatever it is, it's still after him. We need to get out of here before it finds us too. Despite my skepticism at the beginning of this terrifying ordeal, I couldn't help but share their mounting fear. Whoever, or whatever, was responsible for the stranger's horrifying state would likely continue its relentless pursuit. As we pressed on through the increasingly constricting marshland, we started hearing ghastly sounds all around us that seemed to defy comprehension. A mixture of guttural groans and blood-curdling howls filled the air intermittently, closing in from every direction. Surely it couldn't be long before our unknown pursuer caught up with us? Trying to ignore my pounding heart and shaky limbs, I kept moving forward with my friends by my side. In another context, this may have been an amusing escapade, but now it has transformed into a living nightmare. Just when we were beginning to think that perhaps our pursuer had given up or become lost in the darkness, a harrowing scream pierced the still air like a gunshot. The wail was filled with such agony and dread that I knew it could only be one thing. Someone, possibly our injured stranger, had been found. As realization dawned on us, our fear reached a fever pitch. I tried to swallow my rising dread as we turned to face the sound, clutching at one another for support as we debated whether to investigate or continue running. Suddenly, Another blood-curdling shriek echoed through the swamp, freezing us in our tracks. It was then that we made a unanimous decision that would change the course of our lives forever. We decided to call for help, but in this dense swamp, our cell phones had no signal. Frustrated and terrified, we had no choice but to keep moving. As we scrambled through the treacherous terrain, a sickening crunch echoed across the swamp. It was clear that the antagonist was swiftly gaining ground. This sadistic predator wasn't any ordinary human, 
It was a man harboring a dangerous secret. A once prominent surgeon, he lost everything when his controversial experiments became too horrifying for even the medical community to stomach. His relentless pursuit of knowledge led him to undertake dangerous pursuits, including bioengineering and gruesome self-experimentation. His hulking frame loomed in the darkness, his largely human features grotesquely distorted by his cruel alterations. His arms were elongated, with massive hands and razor-sharp fingernails capable of eviscerating a victim with one swift motion. His legs had been replaced with surgically grafted animal-like limbs, which allowed for swift movement even through the sticky marshes, making it nearly impossible for anyone to outrun him. We were utterly outmatched against such a relentless force of evil. Though we desperately wanted to find shelter or reinforcements, our options were dwindling fast as our stamina faded. Sarah caught her foot on an exposed root and tumbled to the muddy ground, shrieking in pain as her ankle twisted unnaturally. Martin and I tried to help her up, but she was unable to bear weight on her damaged leg. Panic surged through us as we realized our only hope was to leave her behind while we went for help. Guys, just go! Sarah urged us through gritted teeth as she bravely tried to fight off her fear. Get help as soon as you can. I'll be okay. With immense reluctance and guilt weighing on our souls, we continued forward as Sarah stayed behind, armed with only a flashlight and the will to survive. Martin and I found ourselves unexpectedly stumbling upon a small clearing where a dilapidated shack stood. The lousy condition of the structure showed that nobody had inhabited the space for ages, but anything was better than staying exposed in the open. As we cautiously entered the shack, we discovered a landline phone gathering dust in the corner. To our amazement, it still had a working connection. Breathing a faint sigh of relief, we called for assistance. After what seemed like an eternity, Help arrived in the form of law enforcement officers and search teams. The swamp was thoroughly combed, but Sarah was nowhere to be found. All that remained of her were bloodstains and tatters of torn clothing, strewn across her last known location. The perpetrator, the monstrous former surgeon, was never caught that night either. His reign of grotesque terror haunted our dreams even after the ordeal ended as we struggled with the survivor's guilt for leaving Sarah behind in his clutches. It wasn't until months later, in an unrelated sting operation, that law enforcement captured this vile creature who called himself a man. Only then did they learn of his dark secrets and twisted motivations and connect him to our unspeakable encounter. Mere weeks after his capture, he died in captivity under mysterious circumstances, much to everyone's relief. In honor of Sarah's memory, Martin and I dedicated ourselves to protecting others from such atrocities. We founded a non-profit organization that raised awareness about unreported dangerous activities while providing support to survivors like us. Though our lives would never be free from the scars that fateful night left, we channeled our pain into something positive. It gave us purpose and passion. Sometimes, even deep within horror, buried beneath heartbreak, you can still find strength indomitable enough to persevere against all odds. A puff of smoke from the fire wafted past my face as I struggled to light the barbecue grill. Nathaniel, an old friend from high school, cracked a joke about my poor fire-making skills. We had planned a perfect get-together, camping in an RV at Red Rock Canyon State Park in Nevada. It was November 2024, and we were eager for a change of pace. A sudden, Loud thump resonated from the side of our RV, stopping Nathaniel in his tracks. 
We exchanged a quizzical expression and went to inspect the source of the noise. We found nothing out of the ordinary. Maybe a branch or rock had fallen nearby. Nathaniel shrugged it off and started setting up fishing gear while I turned back to resume my battle with the grill. As I fumbled around in search of lighter fluid, I noticed my friend Tilly had gone quiet, which was unusual, as she loved camping and telling stories. I glanced over and found her standing rigid by a bush, staring blankly toward the canyon's edge. Her complexion had gone pale and her eyes widened in shock. It wasn't clear what she saw or why she seemed so perturbed. Hey, Tilly, I called out, trying not to sound concerned. Everything okay? She blinked a couple times before finally responding. There's someone over there, she whispered, pointing towards the canyon. I'm sure it's just another camper. Nathaniel chimed in nonchalantly as he continued rigging his fishing pole. I walked over to Tilly and squinted into the distance. She was right. There was a man standing on top of a small hill by the edge of the canyon, gaunt with hollow cheeks and unkempt dark hair hanging past his shoulders. He appeared middle-aged or slightly older. His worn-out clothes hung loosely on his thin frame. This stranger's presence felt unnerving, not because of his appearance, but due to the intense stare he was directing at our campsite. It was menacing and unnerving in its unyielding focus. Tilly shuffled closer to me, her voice barely audible. One glimpse of his eyes, and I felt so helpless. As the man continued watching us, we decided to stick together for safety. Dust descended upon the campsite, and we huddled near the grill that I had somehow managed to ignite. Our light-hearted evening quickly transformed into an edgy night of fitful glances toward the canyon's edge, as he didn't leave our sights, nor did we leave his. Our laughter had all but ceased as the darkness settled in. Nathaniel reluctantly went to collect some extra logs for the fire which had dwindled down to a handful of glowing embers. He hesitated before disappearing into the night. I could tell he didn't want to leave us alone with this disconcerting stranger lurking nearby. Just as Nathaniel returned with arms full of firewood, Tilly screamed out in fear and pain. Hot, crimson blood spattered across my face as something sharp struck her leg. The disturbing stranger was suddenly upon us, his deranged eyes appearing even more unsettling under the flickering glow from the embers. I instinctively shielded Tilly with my body, my survival instincts kicking in. The stranger lunged at us, wielding a sharp, bloodied knife. Nathaniel dropped the firewood and shouted, Run! I'll hold him off! Tilly and I sprinted away from the campsite, terror fueling our escape. We ran without looking back, not knowing if Nathaniel was even still alive. As we stumbled upon a nearby road, the adrenaline pumping through our veins suppressed any thoughts of calling for help. A truck approached us and screeched to a halt. The driver rolled down his window and urgently asked, Are you two okay? What's going on? Still catching our breaths, we quickly explained that our friend was in danger and that there was a knife-wielding man chasing us. Get in, the driver insisted. I've got a CB radio. We can call for help. We hesitated for a moment, but eventually agreed since it was our only option at this point. As we sped towards the nearest ranger station, we provided a brief description of the menacing attacker. Using the CB radio, the driver contacted the rangers, who promised to dispatch units as soon as possible. Our hearts raced as we waited at the station, paralyzed by uncertainty and unable to stop thinking about Nathaniel's fate. The rangers assured us they were doing everything they could while administering basic first aid to Tilly's leg wound. However, their words provided little comfort. 
Hours later, three blood-covered rangers walked through the door with somber expressions on their faces. Folks, one of them began hesitantly. We found your friend Nathaniel. He put up one hell of a fight, but... I'm sorry, he didn't make it. The world around us seemed to shrink away as we absorbed this devastating news. Neither Tilly nor I could find the words to express our crushing grief. The ranger continued, We also found the attacker. He was heavily injured but alive and has been apprehended. An eerie silence hung in the air as Tilly's trembling voice broke through. Why? Why would he attack us? The rangers exchanged uneasy glances before one of them answered her question. We managed to identify the man. His name is Arnold. He was a respected surgeon who lost his medical license and his family after a patient died on his operating table. The adrenaline that had consumed us began to wear off, replaced by drowning despair. Suddenly, another ranger spoke up. Wait. It turns out that your friend Nathaniel shared the same rare blood type as Arnold's deceased patient. We think Arnold may have been seeking some perverse form of revenge. Tilly and I sat in stunned silence. The weight of our losses and the bizarre, senseless connection between Nathaniel and Arnold left us reeling. None of this made any sense. It was a cruel twist of fate that had brought devastation into our lives. Guilt washed over me as I realized we hadn't even called Nathaniel's family yet. With a heavy heart, we made the difficult phone call, knowing that their lives would also be forever altered by this tragic, mind-blowing turn of events. We shed tears for Nathaniel, for the unfairness of it all, for the immense void his absence would leave in our lives, and we mourned for the broken remnants of Arnold's life as well. What kind of unfathomable darkness had driven him to lash out with such brutality? As rangers led the regretful surgeon away in handcuffs, Tilly and I realized there were no winners here, only shattered lives and unthinkable pain. In that moment, amidst the unrelenting anguish, we promised ourselves to honor Nathaniel's memory and to never forget the senseless violence that had taken him from us. Oh, how cruel fate can be! I was honestly surprised at how quickly my camping trip began to implode. There I was, sitting inside our rented RV vehicle while parked alongside a serene lake on the outskirts of Asheville, North Carolina, in October 2021. As I gazed out the window at the silent beauty that surrounded me, I jokingly mumbled under my breath. You know it's been too quiet when even the birds refuse to sing. At that moment, there was a distant and unexpected noise that sent an uneasy vibe through my body. Just as I was about to dismiss it as my overactive imagination at play, a sharp pain engulfed the side of my head. It felt as if something had bitten me with such ferocious intensity that it zapped me back into reality. My good friend Bridget March Felder who had come along with me on this trip for some much-needed relaxation before the start of her new job, immediately noticed my discomfort. Hey Isaac, are you okay? She asked in a concerned tone. Yeah, I think so, I replied. Clutching the side of my head, I managed to get out of the chair and move closer to the RV window in an attempt to locate whatever had caused my pain. As I pulled back the thin curtain to peek outside, there he stood. A man, unremarkable in his appearance and stature. A fairly plain face adorned with a beard and wearing what seemed like ordinary working clothes or perhaps gardening attire. Nothing about him would have caught anyone's eye except for one detail. His eyes, dark and emotionless, sending shivers down the deepest corners of your being. Bridget. I whispered hesitantly and gestured toward the window. 
Her curious gaze quickly turned into one filled with sheer disbelief at what we were witnessing. Our unknown observer took notice that he had been discovered and displayed an eerie grin on his face before slowly walking away from the RV. Not knowing what to make of this bizarre encounter, and without skipping a beat, Bridget rummaged through her belongings and procured a can of pepper spray she had brought for self-defense on our trip. We should call for help. She nervously muttered while keeping a watchful eye towards the direction the strange man had disappeared. The cell reception out here is garbage, but it's worth a shot. I nodded in agreement and reached for my phone. Upon realizing that I couldn't find any service, it struck me that we were truly isolated and vulnerable. As darkness loomed, cloaking both the lake and the forest that surrounded us, an eerie tension filled every inch of the RV. The quiet seemed to grow even more oppressive with every lingering sound, as if mocking our trepidation at what might happen next. Tentatively, we decided to stay within the confines of the vehicle and locked all doors and windows, hoping all would be well in the morning. Suddenly, there was an undeniable sound, footsteps crunching on gravel right outside our window. Bridget's hand gripped her pepper spray tightly, as if it were her lifeline amidst the approaching dread. The footsteps grew closer until they stopped abruptly just outside the door. My heart was pounding so violently that it threatened to burst out of my chest. I silently prayed that this was just my imagination running wild. With every passing second, the pounding of my heart intensified. Bridget whispered, We need to call the authorities now. I tried calling several times, but with no cell reception, we were out of luck. The sound of the RV door handle jiggling sent us into a panic. A knock from the outside caused us to freeze in fear. What started as a gentle knocking quickly escalated to a furious banging. Metal tools clanged against glass as the man attempted to break in. Bridget and I scrambled to find something, anything we could use for defense, considering that our phones were useless at the moment. We had never felt this helpless before. As the man continued assaulting the door, we realized that we needed an escape plan if things got worse. We strategized that if he managed to get in through one entrance, we would slip out from the other, away from his grasp. The next few hours crawled by an agonizing tension. The man's attempts shifted periodically between trying to break in and circling the RV menacingly. Eventually, as dawn approached, his efforts waned. Exhausted and drained, we assumed he had given up when no sound or movement came from outside. As sunlight crept over the horizon, promising hope and warmth, we cautiously emerged from our temporary safe haven. Slow-moving and alert for any signs of danger, we made our way towards the nearby ranger station on foot, hoping for help. The man must have sensed our desperation. He had destroyed our vehicle's tires during his terrifying nighttime hunt. Upon reaching the ranger station, we breathlessly recounted our tale to the sympathetic officials stationed there. Soon after, they mobilized resources to search for our tormentor while arranging transport for us back to safety. During their investigation into the unnerving events of that fateful night, they discovered links between our bearded assailant and a series of violent attacks targeting campers and hikers in the vicinity. They unveiled that he was a former park ranger himself, fired due to erratic and aggressive behavior. We never expected our relaxing trip would lead us to become victims of a deranged individual. Though the man eluded capture after the search, we remain hopeful that his reign of terror will soon come to an end. While the prospect of enjoying the great outdoors still seems enticing for some, we've decided our days of camping in remote locations have come to an end.
It's difficult to comprehend that the man who stalked and terrorized us was initially responsible for ensuring the safety and well-being of park visitors. The knowledge that he is still out there serves as a grim reminder that danger can lurk anywhere. Neither Bridget nor I can shake off the feeling of unease when we think about our close encounter with him, knowing that we narrowly escaped with our lives. It's true, some mysteries are better left unsolved. But this specific event only serves to remind us of how unpredictable life can be and how crucial it is to remain vigilant at all times. For us, this haunting memory remains etched in our minds and serves as a constant reminder to never let our guard down, not even amidst nature's serene embrace. I jolted awake, soaked in cold sweat, as a sickening odor invaded my nose. Geez, I muttered to myself. Campfire smoke is bad, but this is on another level. I unzipped the tent and crawled out into the pre-dawn darkness, shivering as I adjusted to the October chill. My best friend, Leano Bingsley, had insisted we go on this RV camping trip in Yellowstone National Park before the snow hit. What's that smell? Eleanor Sauvageau, another member of our camping adventure, grumbled as she stumbled out of her own tent. She clutched her red blanket around her like a cape. Did someone leave food out overnight? Maybe a skunk came through. Caleb Berkowitz suggested from within the RV. He was always a bit wacky and always had the worst timing with his one-liners, but then again, it was early in the morning. We began our investigation by checking all our food supplies. All of our coolers and boxes were safely stored and locked in the RV. There was no sign of animals raiding our food or any inexplicable mess. I really hope it's not another one of those sulfur vents like last time ventured Liano's girlfriend, Melinda Zambrano, crinkling her nose at the increasingly pungent odor. By now, everyone was awake and trying to locate the source of the smell. Suddenly, Eleanor gasped loudly while staring at something in the bushes near a trailhead. What is it? Caleb asked curiously. Eleanor, I said it cautiously. What are you looking at? What's wrong? Silently pointing towards the bushes, she slowly stepped back toward us. We all stared in shock as we noticed what had made Eleanor freeze with fear. There was an abandoned shoe lying at the entrance to the trail. The shoe appeared to be covered in a sticky, dark red substance. Our sense of unease rapidly escalated as we realized the smell might be connected to something sinister. The fact that our phones weren't working didn't help either, as our remote location had only one bar of an unreliable signal. Do you think something's happened? Melinda whispered, trembling as she clung to Leano. I don't know. But we can't just sit here and do nothing. Leano responded confidently. And since nobody can call for help, we should go and check it out. Our group reluctantly agreed, knowing that if something was wrong, we couldn't just hide from it. We gathered flashlights and hiking sticks, and Lemmy Archuleta, another college buddy of ours, took the lead with his professional-grade multi-tool in hand. As we marched down the dark trail, I suddenly bumped into the person in front of me. The group had stopped unexpectedly. From my position in the middle... I couldn't see what was causing the halt until I finally caught a glimpse of it as Melinda and Caleb shifted slightly. It was a man tied up against a tree with duct tape covering his mouth. His eyes were red-rimmed and tear-streaked, as if he'd been pleading silently with each and every one of us who'd been walking past him. His face was bruised and battered, with cuts and scrapes smeared with muddy blood. Leano stumbled back away from the man, breathing heavily in shock. 
That, that isn't what I expected to find. Someone stuck out here doing this to people. Eleanor whimpered anxiously. Nobody knew what to say or do. What were we supposed to do with this bound stranger who seemed fraught with terror? Lionel finally took action. Stay here, guys. I'll go find help. He tried to reassure us as he turned back towards the trailhead, where we had come from. We waited silently for what felt like hours until suddenly we heard screams from another part of the woods. The screams were gut-wrenching and we knew something terrible was happening. We couldn't leave the tide man, but we couldn't stay here either. Let's get him down and take him with us. We need to find Lionel quickly, Melinda said firmly. We managed to untie him, and without a second thought, we started moving in the direction of the screams. Eventually, we reached a clearing where we saw Lionel lying on the ground, unconscious bleeding, and bruised. Eleanor gasped in horror as we tried to take in the situation. Looking up from Lionel's body, we saw a menacing figure emerge from the shadows. He was a massive man, his face contorted in anger with piercing eyes that seemed void of any empathy. His muscular arms were covered in what looked like dried blood. Every movement hinted at his strength and intent to harm. Unable to call for help or reason with the attacker, we decided that our only option was to run. Carrying both Lionel and the previously tied man between us, we navigated through the dense forest as fast as we could without looking back. The gruesome man pursued us relentlessly with chilling determination. He was swift and unnervingly quiet as he tracked us through the woods. We knew that if he caught up to us, it could be catastrophic for everyone involved. After running for what felt like an eternity, Lemmy tripped on a hidden tree root and fell hard against another tree just beyond the path we were on. Eleanor kneeled beside him as Caleb and Melinda took up defensive positions around their fallen friend. They wanted to fight back but knew they couldn't possibly overpower this monstrous man, who seemed to revel in torturing people. As the attacker moved closer, an unexpected siren rang out through the woods. The man stopped, visibly startled, and then disappeared into the shadows as quickly as he had arrived. Exhausted and terrified, we all huddled together, waiting for the sirens to reach us. The sound came from a nearby park ranger station that we'd happened upon during our flight. They had heard our screams and seen the man pursuing us while on patrol. When the rangers arrived, we explained our terrible ordeal and handed over the two injured men in our group. The rangers quickly contacted local law enforcement officers, who arrived to take them to an area hospital. Overwhelmed with gratitude that help had arrived in time, we couldn't help but feel solemn remembering those we had lost amidst this night of terror. With our friends recovering and a massive search underway for the attacker hiding in the woods, we hoped justice would soon be served. In an unexpected turn of events, we later found out through the local news that the tied-up man was actually an undercover agent trying to gain information on a notorious crime ring in the area. Our discovery of him led to further investigations and ultimately unveiled some of their crimes. The attacker was eventually captured when he sought medical attention for his injuries sustained that night while evading arrest. It turned out he was part of this crime ring, a sadistic enforcer hired by criminal bosses to ensure loyalty among their ranks by any means necessary. While acknowledging how close our brush with evil had been, we were grateful that what started as simply noticing a bloodied shoe led to unmasking criminals and bringing justice for so many innocent victims.